the biota uh, presentation. Um, then tomorrow I'll be talking uh, about uh, snorkel safety and methodology. And um, Friday is the uh, Friday morning is the actual snorkel session out on uh, Whitechus Creek. Thank you, Bruce. Whenever you're ready, Ryan. Uh, Ryan's going to do, uh, and I think Bruce might have to help him out a little bit, but they're, he's going to talk about biota and a little bit of invasive species as well. You ready, Ryan? <laughs> yeah, just about there. OK. Sorry, my internet is very slow at the office apparently today. I'm used to working at home where it works out a lot better. <laughs> yeah, I don't think our, our office isn't that fast either. Today it's actually pretty good. I think there's less people in the office today, so. So bear with us, folks. We're getting there. All right. Hopefully, it'll kick over here in just a second. I have your first I slide. First slide. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Now, everybody, we're going to talk about aquatic biota. So uh, these are the days I get pretty excited about. Um, yeah, we get to go out and actually look at the fish. So we do a lot of fish habitat, but another part of our protocol is the aquatic biota sampling. So we're going to go through a bunch of the approved techniques. We'll also go through a bunch of native fish that you're likely to observe. It won't be a comprehensive list, but at least get you familiar with what you're most likely going to be seeing. And then I'm also going to include a bit of aquatic invasive species at the end. I got a handful of slides for you guys to kind of get familiar with certain species you might see out there that uh, you're going to want to take some extra time to document and make sure that we know that they are in existence there. And if they are not, uh, to quickly report all that information so we can get out there and hopefully eradicate that problem. So. What, why do we use biotic surveys? They're, they're a management tool. Um, we basically can use them um, to you know, understand if our management techniques are effective or not. So there's a few different ways we can go about our biota surveys. We have a few different protocols we can use. Um, one, of the, one of them is an AIAB paired survey, um, as well as just a standalone AB survey. Uh, and then we'll also, as mentioned, we'll go over some of the, the AIS decontam decontamination protocol with you guys too to help you guys understand how to not spread those nasty invaders around your home watersheds. Um, and then we'll, of course, go over it, what we like. To, I like to call a critter cruise, where we'll get to do some uh, a little bit of work on fish ID. Hopefully, folks who will be out snorkeling, we can also get in the water together and point at fish and mumble through our snorkels about what they look like. <laughs> So a management tool. So data is used to monitor the changes and trends within fisheries populations. So understanding how are uh, basically the composition of our populations, the types of species we have, whether they're improving in population size or quantity, or if they're dwindling in a certain area. And so we're kind of looking at the distribution of the species over a given time frame, understanding if it's shrinking or if they're gaining actual distribution. It also provides the status and health of our aquatic populations, as well as it also helps us understand our habitat restoration strategies and if they're actually being effective in actually increasing a population of the desired fish. So generally, we're implementing habitat restoration to improve the quality of habitat for a species, fish species and getting out there, and we actually get to be the surveyors on the ground who get to show 
whether or not they were actually seeing a response from the desired fish species to that restoration project. So kind of cool, get to see if we get to see more fish or less fish, depending on if it's been restored or not, and if that's actually positively affecting your population. Which goes on to understanding the success of the management actions and policies. So maybe there was a policy change that went into place that affects the fisheries population. So we get to go out there and see if it's actually making a difference on the ground. So what are the protocols that we can use? So the Region 6 has a specific set of protocols used to conduct the aquatic biota surveys that is scientifically viable. So basically we use them to determine species present, presence, the distribution of that species, how far it goes through a watershed, what is the limiting, you know, where is the end of a fish distribution? It's basically generally what we're trying to see is how far up our watersheds these species will go. Relative abundance of species, so basically the population size, you know, how many individuals, we can figure out how far they go, but then can we also understand how many are in that population? Um, so our protocols are the AI only, that's our normal physical habitat assessment, that's our general measuring of pools and riffles, and looking at all of the, the parameters in which we will still go on to explain to you guys more, <laughs> don't worry. Um, we also have an aquatic biota paired with the aquatic inventory habitat. So that's actually pairing the physical habitat assessment with the biotic assessment. So it makes for um, some pretty strong data. You can really kind of uh, hone in as to where the fish, what habitats they are really preferring and can kind of help you understand if, you know, you should tailor your restoration one way or other. If you have more dense populations in certain areas, then we want to mimic that kind of thing with our restoration work. And so we get to go out there and kind of determine that and provide those building blocks to our biologists. And then AB only, that's just basically no physical habitat assessments. You're just going out there and conducting the, the biota survey without any other physical habitat surveys in place. You do collect some rough numbers while you're doing an AB only survey for basically getting the, the dimensions of the habitat, but they're real rough. All right, so paired aquatic biota protocol with the habitat survey can do relative ab abundance. So um, basically what you're going to do is you're going to start sampling at your first identified pool and this is already laid out from your aquatic inventory survey. So your habitat survey is already defined which where your initial pool was and then when you're doing your habitat survey you can flag these units as well that really makes it easier to come back to do your sampling when you have a flag sitting there just showing where to go. Um, so basically you go to your first pool and each and you create a site. So each site you create has to have two quality pools within it. In order for it to be a valid sampling location, we want to make sure that we we're incorporating more than just one pool. So it's kind of helping to even it out. Um, let's see. If slides will continue. And at least 10 pools and five riffles must be sampled. So we have to, in order for it to be an entirely valid survey, we actually have to at least 10 pools and five riffles. So basically you have your two quality pools and there'd be a fast water unit within paired with those two quality pools. So we have to have at least one fast water and two pools associated with an A, B site. And no less than 10% of the pools and no less than 5% of the pools can be sampled. So in order to actually have valid data, we have to have at least 10% of the pool sampled and at least 5% of the riffles or fast water units sampled. We must begin at the same location as the physical habitat start and span the entirety of the survey. So basically you must survey your, your entire habitat survey with your biota survey in order for it to be valid to make sure you get your 10% of pools and 5% of riffles. And more intensive sampling may be required than just that 10 and 5% to determine changes in your fish assemblages. So sometimes that is not, if you have a real low density population, sometimes you need more, more habitat to sample in order to come up with any valid data. So that's when you really want to get in with your district bios and your local, your local resources, your local ologists, and kind of get a pulse from them on what they expect in the system and what their recommendations are if you are unfamiliar with the system you're going to sample. And so the other protocol is the aquatic biota only. 
and this determines species presence as well as their geographic range or their upper limit. And the presence protocol is a little different. So it, since it's not paired with the actual habitat survey, it is a, it's def, a little more up to you as, to, as far as where you will be sampling. But generally what you're doing is you're starting at the mouth or the confluence of your stream or a known barrier. If you're already familiar with your fish assemblages below, let's say a waterfall like you see in this picture, you know, are we gonna we go above the barrier to see if we can actually identify any fish species above there and what they are and how much further upstream they could go up that system based on your sampling sites. Basically, the sites can be up to a quarter mile apart if there's no barrier encountered. So you can definitely cover a lot more area with these types of surveys, just being that you can literally sample, you get four sites and you can go about a mile. So you can really get a lot of area covered in this. Um, it is a rougher protocol, but it definitely it does great for figuring out your upper limits of fisheries distribution. And then of course you wanna ID possible barriers that can be easily accessed from roads and trails before you go out. So you know kind of where you're expecting to potentially see, um, you know, where there is a potential barrier. And then you're gonna to wanna to sample above and below that barrier in order to see if you have the same fish assemblages as you did below as above. So some examples of some migration and, and passage barriers that you might be doing this around would be waterfalls. Sometimes beaver dams can actually be uh, fish barriers. Culverts, especially those that are undersized or improperly installed can definitely be fish barriers. And other types of road crossings can also um, count as a fish barrier depending on its situation. And distribution is established. Basically the top point of distribution is established when there's at least three consecutive high quality habitats that are sampled with no desired species observed. So basically by getting in there and getting your three, get your three good quality sites sampled, and then you can, you can confidently say there is no more fish above that location and you have literally located the upper limits of that fish species. So and then next we'll go over the approved methods. So what we have is snorkeling is an approved method, electrofishing, a hook and line survey, stain netting, middle trapping, as well as eDNA as our newest addition to approved methods for aquatic biota sampling. So here's a little uh, abbreviated version of the form. This is the aquatic biota form. Um, it basically is, it's on page, handbook page 62 to 67 or it's in the native biota tab, in the native biota binder, in the tab, the binder tab, if I could speak. <laughs> so how do we fill out this form is on page 63 of your handbook. It kind of goes over the more of the details of what exactly needs to be included. One of the biggest things is the tax of codes. This is in the handbook on pages 65 to 66. Those are the four letter codes that are the abbreviation of the scientific name that you would be entering in for your species code. Um, ID, ID observed individuals to the taxa when uncertain, so sometimes you're not sure of the exact species, so just get it down to as much as you can. Don't, don't fret if you don't know exactly what it is, you know, just try to get as close as you can, and pictures are always great if you can snag a photo that can help you come back to the office and ask somebody who might have a better idea of ident fish identification to verify for you what indeed you're looking at. And then in the AB only survey, estimate your channel unit dimensions within the comments section of this form. That kind of gives you an idea of the length, width, and depth of the, the uh, habitat in which you are sampling. All right, getting more into the acceptable sampling techniques of, again, snorkeling, electrofishing, hook and line surveys, seining, minnow trapping, and eDNA. So first, snorkeling, we're going to go through the pros and cons of each of each method. So basically the pros of snorkeling is that you can see all age classes in ideal conditions. Granted, water quality can affect your ability to see in the water, of course. If you have a more turbid water, it's going to be harder to see a length, you know, very far into the water itself. However, since that uh, you aren't actually using, like say, like a hook and a line, you aren't sampling for just bigger fish. You can literally visually observe all fish species. You don't have little ones getting through your net from electro fishing or anything like that. You're actually getting your eye on them. Um, granted, they can be a bit uh, spooky, so this can be challenging for fish ID as well. 
Um, some of the other cons is they're definitely prone to bias. Um, you know, it's it's a lot easier to see all the big fish cruise around in front of you and easily get distracted and miss the smaller fish. Um, up in the shallows, it can be real difficult. That's when you're, you got your head kinked to the side and you got half your mask in the water trying to count the, the fry darting around the real shallow water. Um, benthic fish are often missed. We have a lot of uh, sculpin species out there and they have a real good uh, ability to blend into the substrate. So when you're snorkeling, these can be real easy to miss when you got a, you know, a nice size, say steelhead or omicus rainbow trout sitting in front of you in the water column. You probably didn't notice that little sculpt and dart between the rocks right below you. Um, so it can be definitely easy to miss those types of fish while conducting snorkeling, but it's also really fun. That's for sure. <laughs> And of course, you must be certified. But for those of you coming out with us on Friday, we'll get you certified. Next, one of our most utilized techniques is electro fishing. It's extremely effective for sampling all age classes. The electricity does not favor one over another. They do require a little bit different settings, but you can shock all age classes. Permitting can be difficult is one of its downfalls, especially if you have listed species. If you're dealing with ESA species, it can be a little bit harder to get these permits due to the ability of the electro fisher to strain the animals. The gear is also heavy. You have to carry this about 30 to 40 pound backpack on your back with a battery, potentially carrying extra batteries with you into the field to make sure that you can actually electro fish all day. So it definitely can be a little strenuous on the surveyor. Um, that's for sure but it's definitely also a very fun technique. Um, and see the binder native biota tab for e-fishing guidelines for listed species. They have some specific guidelines at which not to exceed certain, certain powers and uh, voltages in order to prevent the injury of the fish. Next is hook and line. Uh, one of the uh, less used techniques that I have seen in the region, however, it can be effective especially in small streams where it can be kind of brushy, hard to get an electro fisher in. Sometimes it's real shallow. It can be hard not to injure the fish with the electro fisher due to the lack of water volume. So sometimes a uh, hook and line can be a little bit less invasive to the fish, um, but it definitely can be selective for adult game fish. Generally, um, when you're fishing, you're generally catching larger fish. I have seen this overcome by using very small flies and getting fish down into that just over an inch range. But in general, it definitely selects for adult game fish. But hey, if you can get approval to go do it, I say uh, you should because it's probably not going to happen real often. Last but not least, that's for sure, is eDNA or environmental DNA. Um, cool new new stuff coming out that we recently have gotten approved as an actual sampling technique for us. Um, so it's used to, to monitor the genetic presence of an aquatic species. Ecologists analyze the DNA to detect the the origin. Um, basically, only a couple cells are needed. So skin cells are constantly left off from fish when they're in just their natural environment. So these are essentially collected in a water sample, which Bruce will go over more techniques here shortly and this can be set into a lab and it doesn't take much for them to get a positive hit on a certain species. It's definitely fast and it's pretty cost effective considering um, the lack of exposure to injury when you don't have an electro fisher to even the person conducting the sampling and it's a lot lighter equipment to take out into the backcountry. And it's really valuable for monitoring aquatic invasive species as well as listed species, those threatened endangered species or sensitive species, as it's a very unobtrusive form of sampling, just taking a little water sample. The fish don't seem to get too bothered by it. It can also be used for identifying hybrids um, from bull trout to brook trout and bull trout, brook trout hybrids. It's a very useful tool for understanding the presence of those fishes as well. Um, this was used in the from the Rocky Mountain Research Station to identify the, the bull trout versus brook trout distribution in systems there, um, and it proved to be quite effective. Oh, and of course, there's a few more techniques I forgot about the seining. You know, we don't see a lot of seine netting occurring on the forest. It's definitely very effective. I mean, across the region, I should say, it's very effective in large rivers and along sand and gravel point bars. 
it really can't be used in really complex habitat due to the nature of the net to get snagged up on any debris on the bottom of the of the stream or boulders or any wood. It seems like every branch wants to reach out and grab your seine net when you're trying to pull it through. And it definitely can be pretty strenuous on the samplers, uh, especially if you have some swift water. Those nets can pre create quite a bit of pull and uh, can be kind of hard to, to hang on to if you got swift water, that's for sure. And it rarely samples all of the habitat. It's really hard to get your seine net into the little shallow water areas on the edge of the channel, just again, because of that debris is gonna get in the way. Um, so it's definitely a unique tool, but can be effective if you have yourself a real silty bottom or sand, sand type systems that are larger. Another technique is minnow trapping using minnow traps. It's really cheap. Uh, you can use, you know, bread or salmon eggs for bait. Um, real easy to just put them in. It's real passive. You, it does, um, you know, target the smaller age classes of fish. Generally, a minnow trap is designed for a smaller fish, um, and it will still require a permit if listed species are present. Um, but it's yeah, extremely cheap. If you have an area where you think you would be interested in sampling smaller fish passively, it um, is absolutely effective and approved. All right, next we're going to go into some of our native aquatic biota that you're likely to see around the region. Granted, um, you know, if you're on the west side versus the east side, you're going to see a lot of variation. However, I'll try to just cover general species that we'll see out there in the field. Um, so here's our first example of a couple of fish pictures here. Um, we can see here we have some uh, real dark gums on some of the larger fish there on the right. The fish on the bottom have these par marks you're looking at that are real oval. And the par marks themselves are usually wider than the spaces in between. As well as the adipose fin, it's hard to see in that picture, has black margins around the tip. Hopefully we'll get to see some of these in White Chews Creek, but these are actually Chinook salmon. Um, the, the, the par marks that are oval and wider than the spaces in between for the juveniles is a dead giveaway for their identification. Next, we got a juvenile here on the bottom right that par marks are actually narrower that you, that you see the spaces in between them. And the first two rays of the anal fin are actually longer than the rest. So you can kind of see that it's got a sickle shape to the bottom of the, the fin there on that bottom right corner. And the outer margin of that, that anal fin is usually white as well. And in the adult species up to the left, you can really see those white gums. These are all good identification cues for a coho salmon, also known as a silver salmon, you may hear it called. Uh, real co more common on the coast than you would find more inland, that's for sure. Next, the juvenile here we see has some par marks about centered over the lateral line and usually have large. These are usually two times the width of the par mark, the gaps between the par marks themselves. So you can see real narrow, real small par marks with larger gaps in between them. This is going to be a sockeye salmon or a kokanee salmon. You can really see by the the adult, the spawning adults above really give it away with their real red coloring. They also are called the red salmon is another term you'll heard for them. Uh, I think that's obvious why. But um, the landlocked version is the kokanee. And then the anadromous version, which goes to the ocean and back to streams to spawn, is the sockeye salmon. Next, we've got this big old ugly thing, the pink salmon. Juveniles are really unique in the pink salmon that they have no, they lack par marks. You can just see a real silver body with that blue top, that dorsal side's real blue. Um, and it, their, their nickname is also called the humpy or the humpback salmon, as you can see by the the spawning individual above has quite a defined hump in its back. This again would be more of a, a coastal type fish to see. Next, we've got the chum salmon. These are also called dog or keta salmon. The par marks are faint or absent below the lateral line on the juvenile. You can really see that they're focused mostly above the lateral line. And they also have a modeled green dorsal side. You can kind of see on that juvenile on the bottom that there's kind of some modeling going on in the patterning on its back. And that's a good way to give away the juvenile. The adults get these really cool red, black striping through them when they're coming up to spawn. Real unique for the chum salmon. All 
right. Next, we're going to a landlog version of a steelhead, also known as sometimes as a red band trout, Oncorhynchus omicus. We we call them omicus around here, just that always or on my as their four digit letter species code goes. A lot of variation in these fish. Um, they're amazing in how much variation you can find in in, in rainbows. They, um, you can see here, I have a few examples of a bunch of different ones from real dark, real red stripes to real real light kind of uh, modeling. I call those ones leopard bows. The juvenile, you can see, still has par marks, but they're kind of uneven and they're, they can be more rounded than your salmon, your actual salmon species. And then here's kind of a, um, a poster. We usually like to hang this up during training, but this is the poster of your interior red band trouts. It kind of goes over the different unique populations. This will also be saved onto the NR9 box space if you folks want to get in there and take a look at this more closely. Obviously, it's not very legible, um, but I just wanted to kind of have it up here so you guys can kind of see um, that we do we do have red band trout in the interior more, uh, obviously defined by its red side. But um, yeah, very real neat unique species and, and worth taking a look at this on your own time for sure. And so this is the anadromous version of the rainbow trout. So this would be a steelhead. So these guys are the same thing as your as your last slide. However, their life history involves going out to the ocean for two to three years and then coming back to their natal stream to spawn. Um, real unique species. These things travel hundreds of hundred miles and places to get back to their natal streams to spawn. Um, very resilient fish that is very highly, highly adaptable. Um, hopefully you guys will get a chance to see at least some juveniles of these guys on white shoes on Friday. Um, if you get lucky enough to get an adult, see an adult steelhead at some point, yeah, you probably won't forget it. <laughs> Next, we got a very similar looking fish to the rainbow trout. However, if you notice in the upper right hand corner, you see some very, very red slits in the gills on the bottom side. So we're talking about a cutthroat trout here. There's actually 14 subspecies of cutthroat trout that are native. So definitely talk with your local bios to understand which ones you might have in your area. Coastal are the most common that you'll see along the coast. But we also have West Slope cutthroat trout in areas as well, especially on our forest. That top left picture is a is a good example of a, of a uh, West Slope cutthroat. Generally, with these fish over, besides the the slits underneath the gills, generally you'll notice that these fish have a more densely speckled body towards the tail or the caudal fin, and then towards the front. So generally, your rainbows will have a pretty even speckling across the whole body, whereas these fish will have more of a concentration near the tail and less towards their head. Um, usually a pretty good giveaway of a West Slope versus a regular rainbow trout. However, definitely take pictures and ask for more opinions if you are not sure. They can be they can be challenging to tell apart and they can also hybridize in some places. So adds another little layer of confusion sometimes. Other native species we have are lamprey. A real cool anadromous species, real prehistoric fishes. Um, we have the Pacific lamprey, as well as we have the Western brook lamprey um, in, in certain waters. Make sure you talk to your local biologist to understand what you have so that you can make sure you properly identify them. If you're unsure to, of what species, you can just docu document them as LAXX for their four digit species code. These guys are really cool since they actually do have an anadromous life history and they're parasitic. So they obviously latch on to other fish species to feed. They have rasps in their mouth, little teeth that they use to literally rub a, a sore spot on the fish and have themselves a tasty meal. And then we can have different life histories. I kind of trying to uh, show that in the middle there. You have the amicete, which is the larva, larval version in freshwater. Then you have the macrothalmia, which is the smolt essentially heading out to the ocean, getting that real silvery color. And then on the bottom, there's a pair of adults spawning and they return back up to their natal stream to actually make their own red to spawn in or their nest, I should say.
Next, uh, if you're on the east side, you're going to see a lot of these guys, uh, day species. Uh, they, um, I usually generally try not to identify these to species. I just mark them as RHXX for just their genus. Um, they are native. They're they're much of they're very much a generalist and can survive in very warm water temperatures. They they generally are pretty hard to identify the species. So just a day species usually is sufficient, unless your of course your bios have a, another request. Then of course listen to what they want. One of my favorite benthic species, the sculpin. This one on the right, you can see I was pretty excited about. That's probably about the largest one I've ever electrofished and then vice versa on the left that is the smallest one I've ever electrofished. Um, so yeah benthic bottom feeders life history they blend into the substrate very well um, so keep a close eye out them when you're snorkeling I'm sure we could find some in white shoes uh, the key there is just looking for the movement on the substrate if you see something dart away often you're looking at a sculpin who just went and hid and you can go kind of search him out and see if you can actually get a, an ID on a sculpin um, really neat species uh, definitely don't uh, look past these guys. They're they're good to keep track of. Next, we got a mountain whitefish. So you'll see with these guys, they have a um, they actually do have an adipose fin. So if you look between, it's kind of hard to see on the top picture, but on the bottom you can see between the dorsal and the caudal fin, the dorsal fin, the tail fin. There's an adipose fin, that small fin, right near where the the body starts to taper towards the caudal. And that means that these are actually a salmonid. So they're the same family as our salmon and steelhead. They are native to the area and they can live in a variety of habitats. Uh, well defined by their large scales and their small mouths that tend to be kind of located on the bottom of their faces. So you kind of notice it has kind of a turned down snout. That's a real good identification feature for the white fish. Um, definitely, I'm not sure if we'll see any of these in white shoes. Metolius definitely has them. Um, so keep an eye out for those guys if you see them and make sure you record them. All right, next we're getting on to listed species. This is the threatened bull trout. Has a clear dorsal fin. That's one of the unique things you'll notice about these fish over your um, the brook trout that they can hybridize with as well as your omicus. Um, they have spots on their dorsal. These guys have a very, very clear dorsal fin. They have pink to yellow spots with no purple halo. It's key not to have that purple halo as that is identification feature of a brook trout. So no purple halo. They often have white and only white, not to be confused with a brook trout that can have black as well, but only have white leading edge on their paired and anal fins. And these guys just love clean, cold water. They're kind of the canary in the gold mine in your watersheds. They would be the first species you'll see to start to dwindle when you have poor water quality. So they're an amazing water quality indicator. And yes, they are listed as threatened. Um, beautiful fish, definitely worth taking extra care to handle indeed. And uh, to document their locations is always very important to understand. So your biologist can understand where they are. Next. We're going to go to the brook trout and so these guys are able to hybridize with your bull trout so if you have them together in a watershed definitely keep an eye out for hybridization talk to your biologists on how, what they would like you to do with those fish um, these guys are eastern brook trout so yes they are native to the east coast one of their unique identification is the vermiculations or the worm-like patterning on their dorsal fin and along the back so they have these real cool kind of worm like patternings and that's really unique to the brook trout. You can see them going up the dorsal fin as well. That's a real good defining feature. And of course the adults have that white and black leading edge followed by a red fin. So that's really a, um, a good defining feature. They're an introduced species, of course, um, you know, brought over for fishing. I really, um, people do like to fish for them with sport. They are delicious. Um, you can see the the fry down here on the bottom left has these really blotchy par marks. There's just real no rhyme or reason to them. You can still even see that there's a little bit of color and a, a little bit of spots on the dorsal fin, showing us that it's not a bull trout, but it is indeed a brook trout with the with the fin spots and the darker colored fins really give away that it would need a clear dorsal in order for that to be a bull trout. Next, we got a unique one for you guys. 
this is just cool because I was able to electrofish one one time. This is called a tiger trout. Not probably real likely you guys will see them, but just like to share with everybody because they're just such a cool looking fish. They're a cross of a brown trout with a brook trout. Um, you're probably not going to see a lot of these. As far as I understand, they're mostly sterile, so you're not going to see a lot. But these have been stocked in places and have escaped into certain streams um, out of the lakes in which they were stocked. So definitely worth keeping an eye out. You probably wouldn't forget it if you saw it. Uh, you can see where they get their name, that's for sure. All right, next, let's mix it up. We're going to get over some amphibians. So these are examples of a handful of different spotted frogs. You'll notice that uh, there are two species here. The one on the left is the Oregon spotted frog. The other two on the right are the Columbia spotted frog. Uh, make sure you know which species you're dealing with as uh, the Oregon spotted frog is listed. Um, definitely, you know, if you're out there doing your aquatic biota sampling and you run into amphibians, definitely record them. I have wildlife folks asking me all the time for my amphibian observations, and they love getting to see the pictures and sharing where, where their distribution is as well. So um, just because we're mostly focusing on fish doesn't mean we shouldn't record everything we capture. Next, we got a German brown trout. So these are introduced species. Um, often out competes your native fishes within the same watershed. They consume native juveniles quite readily, um, defined by their their darks to reddish spots on their on their um, basically light brown bodies. The females you can see on this bottom right corner can get a little bit more of a a blue hue to their backs, um, but these are a char and they are not native to our areas. So definitely worth noting if you come across these. And again, another species in which you'll probably want to talk to your biologist with on what to do if you come across them. Next, another frog species, Cascades frogs. These are real common, of course, across the Cascades. Um, you'll see a lot of these in your real fast flowing streams hopping in real quick like. Um, still worth a comment, even when I catch them um, outside of habitat. If I'm even doing a habitat survey, I'll make a note, a note in my habitat comments that, hey, I found a Cascades frog. And hey, if you can catch them and take a picture, go for it. Here, I was lucky enough to grab two at once. Another little guy you'll see out there, the Pacific Chorus frog, also known as the tree frog. They can come in, they can change colors and come in all sorts of colors. So generally a real small species, but uh, often seen in the green form or the brown form, um, but definitely worth taking a note just to understand the species diversity of your system. Next, we got our native crayfish, our only native crayfish. This is the signal crayfish. He's defined by his white at the pinchers where they actually, um, where the pinchers pivot. They can actually kind of pivot the pinchers and flash the whiteness behind them, hence the signal name. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for your crayfish species. Uh, we'll go over some of the invasives here in a little bit, but um, definitely know all found crayfish. And they, these guys are known for having their smooth claws, whereas the other species will have rougher claws. The invasives will all have rougher claws, and we'll go over each of those here shortly. Another species you may encounter out there is the beaver. Whether you're lucky enough to actually see one, or just noticing the chews as on that picture on the right. It's always good to just make comments if you do come across any beaver activity. Um, you know, they're definitely nature's engineers and your biologists are definitely going to want to know where these bad boys are hanging out. Uh, very important and uh, great if you get to see a lot of activity from them. Take lots of pictures for sure. All right, now we're going to switch gears over to the aquatic invasive species you're likely to come across. So the region has identified a focal aquatic invasive species list due to their potential impact on aquatic and riparian habitats. So your job as a stream surveyor is to record AIS discovered during your field work. You know, we get out into a lot of unique places in which folks may not step another foot in for another 10 years. And since you're out there and you got eyes on the ground, it's real important to just document just about everything you can find, specifically in aquatic invasives if you come across them to be able to you know, actually report these early enough that we might actually be able to catch them be before they become out of control. So you're going to record the AAS status daily on the Aquatic Invasive Species Daily Report form. If an AIS species is detected, your crew lead needs to pass this information along to local biologists, Katie Sirius, and Jim Caperso ASAP. 
basically we want to send this information up the line as soon as we can to see if we can't actually get out there and eradicate this species before it becomes a problem. So next we're going to come go over some of the more common invasive species surveyors are likely to find. It's not a complete list, let me remind you, um, as we don't have our full aquatic invasive species list presentation, presentation occurring this time, but we do have it recorded. So make sure you get on that YouTube channel and check out the full recording if you're looking for some more information. Um, there's also a primer invasive species primer in the box space and and as well in the reference materials binder. Um, I definitely really recommend checking out that that invasive species primer on box. It's real helpful. There's also identification guide in there that kind of quickly goes over each one of these that I'll cover and more into a little bit more detail. So here's what the form looks like. Here's the aquatic invasive species daily report form. Um, so basically just while you're walking out to the channel, while you're doing your warm and pebble count, if you're walking out to go measure your flood prone width, keep your eyes on the ground and around you to see if there's anything uh, of interest, you know, if something that shouldn't be there. So you can kind of see there's some detecting methods in here where you talk about just if you're walking in and walking out or if you're when you're doing your pebble count or say you're doing a, a measured unit and taking a temperature and you notice something. Um, you know, it's not we're not asking you to go out of your way to scour for these species, but just keep an eye out while you're out there doing your job and just to record anything you do see. And of course, if you don't see anything for that day, you can literally just put, you know, no IAS observed and continue to use this form for multiple days if you're lucky enough not to come across any. All right, so getting on to some of the species. One of our most common little invaders that we have is the New Zealand mud snail. This guy is very, very small, only a half a millimeter to six millimeters long with a brown shell. They have about five to seven whorls or spirals across the body. The shell opening has an operculum, so a small covering. They, and they transfer really easily due to their small size and ability to survive extreme conditions. These guys, since they have that operculum cover, they can seal up and hold their moisture for quite some time outside of the aquatic environment. And you can see down there on that lower picture next to a penny their size. And then down here on the right, I got a little distribution map zoomed in for our region so you can kind of see where they're known right now. Doesn't mean they're not, this isn't up to date or they're not already expanding, but just kind of something to be aware of if you're if you're somewhere in that dark range, you know, definitely keep an eye out for these guys and uh, definitely make sure you're not transporting them. And we'll go over some decontamination tactics here later. Next would be the zebra mussel. This guy is about two millimeters long and triangular shaped. These guys incur in large clusters. You can see by these two lawn chairs that somebody seemed to have lost into a body of water and how they've really just taken a hold of those. Um, these guys are striped with dark bands and they easily spread due to its free swimming juvenile life stage. So at the juvenile stage, they're actually within the water column, free swimming around. So it makes them really easy to pick up and ballast water, um, they're just real easy to, to transport, so definitely something to you know keep in mind. They're an insanely efficient filter feeder and increase water clarity, um, which you might think is a good thing, but this is in areas where the water shouldn't be clear, so they can really lead to large and potentially toxic algae blooms where they inhabit and invade. We're not seeing too many of these, as far as I understand, on the West Coast yet, um, but they are spreading and definitely want to keep you guys aware of them. Next, the quagga mussel. This guy is up to four millimeters long, has a more rounded shell than the zebra mussels, and it has those brown, dark brown markings on the light shell casing. They have a unique ability to, to colonize hard surfaces very densely. As you can kind of see on this bottom right picture, that's a, a round PVC pipe in which is almost completely clogged. So this creates a lot of problems for machinery like canal locks, docks, buoys, and just vessels in general, hiding these up into their, um, you know, uh, me mechanics and just fouling them. So it costs a lot of money is basically the, the moral of the story there. Um, next would be the Asian clam. These guys, uh, adults range from one to five centimeter wide. Their shell is yellow green to tan. The shell will be also white where color is flaked off. 
that's another unique thing. And they have those real distinct growth rings. You can really see it almost looks like tree rings going over the shell. So real distinct ridges um, are a good way to identify these. And they're really good at out competing our native mollusks. You can kind of see down there in the bottom left, I kind of have a scale, size of scale compared to our, our native organ mussel and uh, the invasive clam. And so they're a lot smaller, um, but can easily out compete our natives and are spreading pretty rapidly. So definitely want to be real careful about spreading these guys. Next, I'm going to move on to the big eared radix. This is a snail that grows up to three centimeters tall. The shell is yellow, beige, or tan, and this shell lacks an operculum, so it doesn't have the cover. The real unique thing you'll see with these guys is the last whirl is 90% of the body volume. So you can really see that last whirl is really opened up. Um, and so that's their, their real unique identification characteristic. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for these guys. They definitely graze on a lot of vegetation and we'll definitely want to know if these guys are spreading as well. Um, they can be hard to identify in the real small sizes. Uh, the juveniles can be easily mistaken for natives. So if you think you see something of interest, collect a sample, bring it back, have somebody who knows what they're doing, you know, I can hopefully identify it for you a little bit closer. Next, we have the Chinese mystery snail. These guys are pretty large. Uh, they're over five centimeters. They're, they're green to brown. They have six to seven whorls and the shell opening has an operculum, so re resistant to drying. Um, these guys are impacts aren't really well understood yet, but uh, they're definitely out there um, on the West Coast as well. So definitely want to make you guys aware of these guys. Next, we're going to go into some of the cra common crayfish species we have for invasives in the region. Uh, the rusty crayfish. This one hits close to home because we do have these in the John Day area. Um, they're real unique in that they have that real large brown to reddish spot on the carapace. The carapace is also known as the body. Um, you'll never see any native with anything like that. And it, so it has it on both sides of the shell and the claws will have the, the bumps. They're, they're, they're not smooth like the native, so they have more of a bumpy type surface. And they have black bands at the tips of the claws. That's another unique identification feature. And these guys are just good at out competing the natives and disrupting the whole native food chain. Um, so keep an eye out for these guys. And again, uh, ask your biologist what you should do if you come across a handful of these guys. They're definitely good at uh, invading new places. People like to use them for fishing bait, so they're commonly transported as a bait into different watersheds. Next, we have the red swamp crayfish. Adults are generally five and a half to 12 centimeters in length. They're a dark red in color with a black stripe on the abdomen. The claws are have red spike knobs on them with large narrow pincers. So they have they almost look like a uh, a crab claw in a sense, real, real bumpy. Um, and these guys are real, real aggressive and aggressively outcompete their natives and can actually be a host to parasites and disease as well. Um, you can see that the there's some of that in the map I got there in the lower bottom left corner. The area in the south that shaded in orange is actually their native range. With everything else shaded darker is where they're introduced. Next, we have the ringed crayfish. Adults are up to 90 centimeters in length. They have two dark stripes across the width of the central carapace, kind of that unique two stripe feature you see in that bottom left corner. And they have a pair of dark stripes that run lengthwise across the edge of its abdomen. And these guys have a orange tip on their pincers. That's a unique identification feature of these guys. Um, they are located in Oregon, so we'll definitely keep an eye out on these guys as well. Next, we'll go to a big furry animal. This is the Nutria, more common on the west side than the east side, not to say they're not over here. Um, these guys are an Asian relative to the beaver. And so what they do is they create these large burrow networks in the banks of streams and they undermine the banks and create, create instability. So basically burrowing into the banks, creating large tunnel complexes that then weaken the bank and cause them to fail. And at high densities, they can actually turn marshlands into open water by their excessive feeding habits. So basically eating all the vegetation out of a marshland and creating an open water habitat. Next, I'll hit on a few of the riparian plant species. Uh, 
Bob Hassmiller will go over these in more detail, but uh, we talked about potentially putting them in there twice. So I'm just going to go through these guys pretty quickly, and Bob will probably give you a little bit more detail on them in the future. Um, first one's the yellow flag iris, 0.4 to 1.5 meters tall, only one with yellow flowers, stiff sword-like leaves, and they have a three-sided shiny green fruit that outcompetes natives and traps sediment, filling channels and wetlands. Next is the knotweed species, two to four meter bamboo-like stems, real large. Stems bend gently at each node, and they're, they create monoculture hedges that form underground roots. Um, these broad leaves are rounded and flat or heart-shaped at the base and taper to a point towards the end. And they, they have drooping clusters of greenish-white flowers. Himalayan blackberry can rapidly spread and colonize both disturbed and undisturbed sites. Grows in large thickets heavily armored in thorns. And native blackberries trail across the forest floor and have small berries in comparison. And so these guys generally have three leaflets, while Himalayan has five. Next one is English ivy. This is an evergreen climbing vine with three to four lobes per leaf. Vegetative growth dominates and robs sunlight from invaded woody host. Leaves and seeds can produce a mild toxin. And these guys are super difficult to eradicate once established. Really just choke out your riparian vegetation. So next, I want to go over a little bit of decontamination protocol with you guys. Um, anytime you're moving from one watershed to another, or you're just moving from a stream in which has known invasive species, you'll want to be decontaminating your gear. So this may require you scrubbing your boot stream site every day. Um, that alone, most invasives are usually trapped in the mud and debris that are on your gear. So even just by scrubbing your boots to remove the mud and vegetation, all the small critters can really help in preventing the spread of any of these invaders. Other options include freezing gear for 48 hours. You can also spray your gear with Formula 409. Um, that tends to be our, our general tactic as it's, it's quick and gets the job done, as well as 30 days drying time in the shade. Uh, you can have quicker drying time in the sun, but I don't recommend leaving your gear out too long in UV exposure because it really breaks down weighter material quickly. And so an example of a roadside chemical treatment, if moving to a new stream, would be to one, spread some four millimeter plastic sheet eight by eight feet on top of a road, lay your boots, waders, drag tape, and wet gear on top of your plastic sheet, and then spray your gear with the 409 solution. Give it 10 minutes to soak in and really make sure it's treating everything. And then you'll want to bag all your gear and the sheet in a heavy duty plastic bag. You'll want to rinse all your gear where rinse water will be neutralized. So don't rinse right next to the stream. <laughs> Basically, if you have, to, hopefully you can go somewhere where there's actually a drain, but if you actually have to rinse into the, in, in the woods, you'll want to make sure you're at least very, very far away from any water sources. It's real important not to get any of these solutions back into your water source. For one, it might have the NAIS species in it still, or the, the toxic chemicals can also wreak havoc on the system as well. And I'd like to emphasize that not all aquatic species are removed by the same treatment methods. You can look in your AIS guidebook framework in the AIS binder tab to find out everything you need about certain species, certain invasives and what it takes to actually kill them specifically. Another good technique if you got money for it is maybe you can justify a second set of field gear so you don't have to be constantly decontaminating your gear every time you have to switch a watershed. You can literally wait and grab another gear, maybe let your original gear dry out without having to put a bunch of nasty chemicals on it. And with that, I believe we'll be switching over to Bruce Hansen to talk to you guys a little bit about eDNA. Okay, Ryan, hey, are, Ryan. You, are you going to be flipping um, slides for me? I can do. Okay. Um, are you guys getting a um, echo off of me? 
Nope, you I'm not getting anything. I'll, I'll make yeah. sure to mute. It's probably just me. I'm hearing an echo. Uh, we'll try and get around that. Um, it's better now. I got it before, but I don't get. It. I don't have it now. So you just. We'll go ahead. Um, it was me. First, a few uh, general caveats about um, uh, biotic surveys. Things to keep in mind. Um, just remember that there's a distribution of uh, fish across a watershed, and it changes depending on your uh, your location. So you may be sampling in one place, but uh, depending on where you're sampling, you could be missing some of the uh, other species that are uh, are that are in the basin. Um, and that's just you know keep that in mind. Next slide. And this is just a, again, this is the area where traditionally uh, most of the surveys have been. So if that's the case, then you can see what information you'd be missing if uh, you didn't sample elsewhere. Again, just keep it in mind. Next slide. Um, other caveats. Uh, again, so these are the biases. Uh, Ryan mentioned some of these uh, before. And uh, I think the key there is, one of the big keys is, is that most of our surveys are done in the summer. So you, the life histories of these uh, aquatic organisms may have them either not in a particular uh, stream, depending on time of year, but also with them moving. So. Your aquatic surveys are getting giving you a, a snapshot, but not um, not necessarily a complete census of what's in the stream. Next. EDNA. So it's um, kind of the latest and greatest, and everybody thinks that it's the going to be the magic bullet. And uh, wanted to go through some of the methods, but also maybe highlight some of the ways it's being used now. So if you look on the left there, uh, again, the DNA is in the water. All, uh, all organisms are shedding DNA, both plants and animals, uh, humans. So it's there to sample. And the trick then is uh, getting down to the species of interest. So it starts with your Collecting a, uh, a sample, depending on the protocol, you're going to be wanting, um, there'll be a certain volume that you collect. In the field, you're uh, filtering that, bringing that uh, filter paper back in the lab. The DNA is actually extracted. And in this case, this is a single species uh, analysis. They then, uh, after they've amplified that uh, DNA, they uh, use a primer that will bind with the particular species and it fluoresces when uh, it binds to that, uh, that gene. Next. So the start, get the water sample. The key there is uh, upstream from you. Uh, and if there are other uh, contaminants or other issues upstream of them in the stream, uh, you're wearing gloves for um, the, the main reason is, is a different pair of gloves with uh, each sample so that you're not contaminating between samples. Uh, you're also keeping uh, the human genes out of the sample. That usually isn't a, uh, an issue though. Next. Uh, this is the, in its simplest form, the way that you'd be uh, filtering that sample. So you're pouring the water um, into that uh, container. There's filter paper at the bottom. You're drawing a vacuum uh, and pulling the water through the, uh, the filter. Next. 
Sometimes we want multiple samples or have one or set up at a location and have multiple locations. So it can be anywhere from that one sample at a time to uh, one of these sorts of things where you're pulling a vacuum in that big tube and you're able to process multiple samples at once. Next. This is what you're going to see. The bottom uh, filter is after collecting a sample. So that's DNA, that's dirt, can be plant material. That's everything that you filtered out of that water sample. And that's what you um, roll up and send to the lab for analysis. Next. Oh, back on that one. Uh, sometimes if you're in really muddy water, um, you may not be able to collect the complete sample. You're, you're going to have to take two samples to get through the water volume uh, that you want to sample. So the filters can get clogged in really uh, turbid water. OK. So this is by far the um, predominant way of uh, eDNA sampling. and. Um, this is a single species sample. So again, your the water you collect and uh, filter has DNA from multiple species. And uh, but in this particular case, they're only interested in in one species. And <clears throat> so all the other DNA is uh, unnecessary for the sample. So you extract the DNA. Uh, hopefully with the target uh, DNA in there if the organism was present and you run it through this um, detection process where you'll see a change in uh, in light as the uh, primer, which are the chemicals you're using to identify particular genes, uh, as that primer binds and uh, fluoresces. Um, and again, this has been the it was the original methodology. Uh, it's well established. Many many species are uh, do have primers, and uh, if you're only interested in one species uh, or just a few species, it uh, is relatively inexpensive. But if you're trying to get the um, sample or try and figure out what the community the aquatic community is running that sample multiple you know that uh, dna sample multiple times uh can end up getting expensive next this is an example uh that um, might be relevant in terms of if you're looking at end of fish distribution so this was uh looking at 31 streams throughout Western Oregon and Washington. Uh, to interpret this, the uh, lowest sample point in the stream for both the eDNA and electrofishing is in the is in the center. So think of these this as mirror images of each other. And uh, each row is a stream and the columns are different locations. So if you look at that first row, you can just see that uh, electrofishing, they got uh, detected fish up four sites on the stream, whereas uh, three, four, five, there are six sites where they collected eDNA. Again, there were some places where they didn't see it. Um, so who knows? It's not 100% perfect, or uh, maybe the fish really weren't there. But as you go down here, you can see that the eDNA is far more sensitive. Um, and in this in this paper, you know, sometimes they were getting detections as much as 250 meters above the last uh, electrofishing detection. So if really nailing down that uh, end of fish is important, this might be a way that uh, you can combine it with electrofishing to see if uh, there are fish up there that you're just not getting with electrofishing. Next. A newer um, 
method that's being in the process of being developed and uh, tested out is uh, looking at multiple species at once. So again, you're taking all of that DNA that's in the sample, extracting it, um, amplifying it, which means that you're just uh, getting more of the DNA so you can get up to a sample that is uh, easily, uh, more easily detected. And in this particular uh, example, they're testing for 48 taxa uh, across um, 48 samples. So that could either be different locations or replicates within a location, things like that. The difference is, is that they take uh, that, the detection of segments of DNA and using computer methods, they reassemble the, uh, the genetic sequence so that, and it's those sequences that they know belong to particular taxa. So they can go and identify those species that are in the water in in the water that you sampled. Of course, they have to know the genetic makeup of those species before they can uh, recognize that. One of the other things that uh, can come out of this is is a relative abundance of DNA. So you you will see a range of the amount of DNA. Um, in, amongst the taxa, all species don't shed the same amount, so that relative abundance um, may or may not be useful. Um, but if you were doing it over seasons, you might see differences in the uh, amount of DNA sampled. Uh, next slide. And this is a, a pretty busy uh slide and actually it's the two left columns that uh, you want to look and again it's a comparison between uh electrofishing and eDNA this one was done um on Fall Creek a tributary of the LC uh where we sampled and if you look uh the columns are sites sample sites going upstream so one through um five we didn't sample site three because there's actually a fish hatchery there and that kind of confounded things but what i wanted to show here is again um if you look um under the rainbow uh row edna detected uh rainbow trout in that upper reach that uh electrofishing didn't and i'll there's a lot of uh, similar results here when you look at those uh, named species up above. Below that is sculpins. And the first row in sculpins were unidentified sculpins. So um, didn't know what it was. Sculpin taxonomy can be confusing. Uh, the next three rows are uh, where we identified two species. And if you can look at that third row, um, there's a species that we detected using uh, eDNA, using DNA that was not detected um, using electrofishing. And again, there can be cryptic species of, uh, of sculpin. Below that are DACE results. Uh, the electrofishers figured that they uh, were able to identify. So that's two for, um, we're looking at, at four rows there. Um, the electrofishers had uh, all but one of the species they figured they identified. Um, and the three below that were are known species. And again, um, Differences in where they were uh, detected with dace that might have been a misidentification, or actually the the fish weren't there or weren't detected by eDNA. Um, and you know you have differences in presence between those. Lamprey, similar results. 
tailed frogs, uh, eDNA detected them at the highest reach where they weren't uh, detected electrofishing. The other one, the next one down is actually a, a chorus frog, which is a riparian species. So you can understand that the electrofishers uh, probably wouldn't get it, but uh, it gets in and out of the water often enough that it really was detected in the, the eDNA. So that's just kind of an oddity to pick up a riparian species. Below that are um, salamanders and newts. And you can see that uh, if you look at the bottom two rows, again, just reinforcing that uh, you see different things. So uh, eDNA detected a species that electrofishing didn't, and electrofishing had an ID that we didn't see with eDNA. Crayfish, similar results. Um, so depending on your question, you can start teasing out um, different species. You can also uh, start looking at genetic diversity within a species because you've got all of the, uh, the DNA, you have assembled that whole gene. So you can look at differences within a species also and get a sense of uh, diversity. And uh, that's it. Uh, in terms of the single species work, the most common place that you'd be sending your samples would be to the Rocky Mountain uh, Research Center, to the research station, to the National Genomics Lab. Um, you have a protocol uh, in the uh, reference material and uh, contact information as to uh, where to send samples for single species determination. And they would also, if you have, if you're interested in a species that they do not currently have a primer for, they'll also work with you to develop uh, primers. That's work that's been done with uh, one of the places where that's really helped out is with uh, sensitive species or relatively rare species that um, we hadn't gotten around to developing a primer for. They'll develop a specific primer. And uh, that's it. Thank you, Bruce and Ryan. Good job, you guys. That's a lot of information, but um, really good stuff. And you guys should get more training at the forest level, um, just because you're, everybody has different species on their forest. So make sure you check in with your bios and uh, get out on the stream and hopefully see good stuff. So we are going to take about a 15 minute break um, just to get you guys up and moving. Make sure you get up, stretch, get yourself loosened up and be back at uh, 1.30, please. Thank you. If you have any questions for Ryan or um, Bruce, make sure you hit them up.
OK. Hopefully people are back. Can I hear some uh, yeses? I'd like to hear some voices for a change. So some people shout out that you're back. Yay! Yeah. Hey, I'm here. I'm here, yeah. Katie. Yeehaw! We're back <laughs> yep, here in Walla. Here. Thank you. I like that. I can't since I can't see your faces. I have no idea how if you're all sleeping or what you're up to. So we're gonna try to keep this going and hopefully you guys will learn about survey methodology and channel habitat units. All right, can you guys all see this? Everything looks good? I can yes. see it. Got it. Good. Yes, looks good. Excellent. All right, so we're going to talk about, um, this is kind of the, like I said, this is a um, meat of the survey of our protocol. It's collecting habitat attributes and um, just a little bit about survey methodology and, and working through a survey as you do a stream survey. So we're going to go through the channel unit overview. We're going to look at the channel unit types and the attributes that go with those, so whether you collect what attributes you collect on each of those channel units. We're also going to talk about special cases. Ryan talked a little bit about waterfalls and looking where how whether they're barriers or not. So we're going to talk about how to fill out that um, information and look at those as well. So there are uh, the main channel habitat units within the st uh, stream surveys. Slow waters, which are our what we call pools. We've always, you know, and went in between. I still call them pools. You'll hear me call, say pools all the time, but the slow water is uh, the same as a pool. So that's uh, usually no uh, surface turbulence. So it's usually low gradient. There's, um, there can be surface turbulence, but for the most part, you'll see a real change between your fast waters and your slow waters. You have a residual pool depth. Can anybody tell me, um, I can't see hands on my thing right now, but can anybody tell me, quick raise your hand and tell me what um, residual pool depth is? Anybody? Anybody, somebody? It's max depth minus pool tail crest. OK, so Casey said it is max depth minus pool tail crest. And so your pool tail crest is at the bottom part of your pool. And we'll I'll show some examples of that later. But at the very end of your as you're walking upstream, you're going to look at your pools. You're going to look at where your pool tail crest and you're going to get your max depth along that line. And then you're going to have your max depth in the pool. So the pool crest or the maximum pool depth minus your pool tail crest will give you your residual depth. And that's would be what would be left in that um, uh, pool if there was no water um, flowing at all within the stream. It has to be channel spanning, which means that the pool has to go across the entire wetted channel. Sometimes you'll have a lateral scour that has um, kind of just a little bit of scour on one side and scour is just where the um, water is moving the sediment and the bottom out and it's creating depth and that's when we talk about scour that's what we are talking about so um so if you've got some scour on one side and then a riffle on the other then that's not channel spanning but there are a few exceptions to that can anybody tell me what some exceptions are to that just yell them out if you got them anybody come on Plunge pool. Plunge pool. Thank you, Ryan. Yes, a plunge pool can be wider than it is long. And a plunge pool is a pool that has either a waterfall or it might be a debris jam, but there's a vertical drop at the at the back end of the pool, creating the scour and creating a plunge. So the pool is created by the plunge, and that can be wider than it is long. Anything else? Beaver dam I know pool. some of you. What's that? A beaver dam pool? A beaver dam pool. Like that big old pool that Ryan saw behind his beaver dam. A lot of times they're going to be way wider than they are long. So you let um, those are definitely those are an exception as well. Good job. So that's one of our main channel units. The other main channel unit is a fast water channel unit. And that's also you'll hear me call it a riffle. But you have cascades and there's other um, aspects of a fast water unit. We'll talk about those. The um, 
the other types of different fast water units that there can be. But you're going to have turbulent surface, so it's going to usually have a pretty rough surface. It's going to have an increased gradient over your um, over your slow water units. Generally, there's emergent substrate, which means the substrate and the, and the um, boulders and things like that are sticking out of the water, creating that turbulence. And again, those must be longer than wide, and they don't. There's no exception to that rule for fast waters. So there are typically second and there can be a second and third level channel types. So with a slow water, you have an SD, which is a dam pool. So if a pool is behind a dam, then you can call it an SD specifically. There's scour pools, there are plunge pools like we talked, so that would be an SSPL, and then you have a beaver dam pool. So that's SDBV. So these are all codes that are I'm going to be on your data sheet when you see the data sheets. These are the codes that you'd use to um, code these specific types of slow waters. Generally, you don't have to code anything, but you can just call the slow water, whether it's any of these types of pools, as long as you're um, being consistent, you can just call them slows. Sometimes that helps in the quality control world as well. Fast waters, the two main channel um, types that you might use is a fast water turbulent with an FT, and that's just a very, you know, turbulent water surface, high gradient. And a lot of times you might have a, what's called a fast water non-turbulent. And that might be something like a glide where there's not a lot of scour, but you don't, but the surface is relatively smooth, but you don't have any real residual depth or any scour to be um, had. So that would be one that you could use just to kind of break up your habitat units. Some of the other main stem channel units, you have uh, uh, dry channels, which of course are dry. So if you have no flow within, say you might have some water and then you have a section of dry channel, you'd code that D so it has no flow. There's braided channels and the braided channel is also considered a special case and that's a series of three or more channels that run parallel to each other. So they wouldn't have, they have unstable islands in the middle and they don't, so there's no permanent vegetation anywhere, but you have a bunch of multiple channels. And so what you're going to do with that is you're going to add up all of the wetted channel widths within that braided channel, and that's going to be your total width. But definitely, if you have questions during this, um, please don't hesitate to ask. And then we have special cases, and those are um, channel units that are beyond the main ones and um, that are going to be what we call, they're special. You know, everybody's a little bit special sometimes. And they're usually something that's just unusual and there's not a ton of them within the channel units. So culverts, of course, is an art, it's called RTIF, and those are the uh, round pipes or open arches under roads most of the time. You have artificial dams, which of course we do have some of those. They might be a dam that's part of an irrigation system. We have waterfalls. It's a natural vertical fall over a bedrock system. Now, if you're going to have, you just have to make sure that those are over bedrock. If you have a waterfall that's created just by a bunch of um, wood, that's not, we wouldn't call it a waterfall because it's not permanent. We have chutes, which is a, uh, it's kind of a groove. Usually it's in bedrock where it's a groove and it's just the water is just kind of shooting through. I, that's what it kind of shoots through there. Um, and that's the type of channel unit would be a chute. It's generally over bedrock. Marshlands, those are definitely where you run into those multiple channels. It's a big wet area. You, not, you usually can't find one channel um, through an entire section. It's usually all wet. Or you've got one really deep channel, and then it's just wide open and it's wet on either side. And then you have your beaver dams. So specifically beaver dams, if you come across like the one like Ryan had, you would actually create a special case for that beaver dam so then that way it's recorded in that time and place where you have um, you see that beaver dam so then there are also off channel habitat units so you have side channels now the side channels are is a channel that's ladder flows laterally to your main channel but within that on that island in between the two channels, there's going to be stable vegetation and permanent vegetation. And that's going to be like your your alder, uh, might be a cedar, it might be um, 
willow is sometimes i mean if you've got really a lot of willow it's not always a permanent um, vegetation but if you've got a good soil layer underneath um, on that island then you would consider that so that channel a side channel and when you're coming up on something if you've got the channel that has the most flow is the one you're going to use the main channel side channel will be the one that's got the um, lesser flow if you happen to have a a channel that's pretty similar. There's about 50% between the two channels. You try to pick the channel that has the best habitat because that's what we're really looking for. And the side channels are really habitat because they're refuge. They're refuge for young fish and rearing place for them to get out of a main channel, especially if you've got a really uh, high flowing stream. And then you have tributaries. That is the secondary channel coming into the main channel that has uh, can be named there's gen uh, generally it's coming off of another. It's got its own valley um, where it's coming and meeting and uh, distributing flow into the main channel. So that tributary, you're going to enter that data. It gets its own row. And we I didn't talk about uh, sequence orders. So you have. When you break down your habitat units, you break them into sequence orders. So it's one, two, three, four, and you'll see more of this when you I'm going to have you watch the video and um, go through it, how to fill out a channel unit form. That'll help you. But there's each one of the habitat units gets assigned a sequence order. A new tributary will get its own sequence order. And then there is specific information that's collected on that tributary. So we have temperature, time, percent flow contribution, gradient, bank orientation, and whether it's accessible to fish. Now we're going to go back to bank orientation. Now that is something that with the region, we are saying that the bank the bank orientation is as you look downstream. So that's so if you look downstream, you're um, you got your left bank and your right bank looking downstream, and that's a hydrology uh, deal. And then you're going to definitely identify that tributary on the map, if possible. And um, generally, especially if you've got a larger one and it's uh, you want to be able to take GPS units on that. Uh, tributary. So again, the channel units, each one is assigned an individual sequence order and you'll hear SO a lot. It's not supervisor's office, it's sequence order and they are continually um, sequential from reach to reach. So if you end your first reach at SO50, second reach is going to start with SO51. You don't start over on the SOs again. Your habitat numbers are sequential for each individual habitat unit. So for every pool, whether it, it doesn't matter what kind of pool it is, it can be a plunge pool, it can be a dam pool, beaver dam pool, they're all sequential. So you'd have S1, S2, S3, S4, and they continue on again through the next reach. If you end S10 in reach one, S11 is going to start your, so, your slow waters in, in reach two. And that's the same with all of your fast waters as well. So just make sure that they are sequential. You don't start over at any point in time. And then each and every type of fast water or slow water gets a sequence order, a sequential sequence order or habitat individual number. Sorry. So they must be longer than they, than they are wide. We talked about this. The exceptions are special case habitats. We didn't talk about that, but some of the, the um, if you've got waterfalls, dams, those types of things, they can definitely be wider than they are long. And channel uh, channel spanning plunge pools. Those are, we talked about that. And then beaver dam pools. So we've got all these types of channel units. I'm just going to flip through them real quick here. So we've got um, different things that we collect on each one specifically. So with slow waters, you have lengths, widths, max depths, depth at pool, tail crest. And when we, the really nice thing is we'll be able to actually go outside and I can show you what the pool tail crest is and how to uh, collect that um, maximum depth at pool tail crest. But these are the things that you will collect at every different channel unit, length, width, max depth. Um, and then you go on in the side channels, you'll s split up the side channels in whether or not they have more slow channel habitat, um, units or they have more fast. 
So then you would call it a side S if it had more slow water habitat units or a side fast if it just seems like it doesn't have a lot of pools within it. And you only collect length, width, and max depth on those fast those side channels. Dry channels, you'll only collect length on those. Uh, braided, you'll do the length, width, and max depth. And again, the width is going to be the uh, the sum of all of the wet channels in a multiple channel braided habitat. And that can get pretty tough sometimes, but you just do the best you can for the most part on those. Culverts and man-made dams, um, and we'll, they'll go through the um, special habitat unit or the special case you form, but um, you're definitely going to have a few other items like jump height, and we'll talk about that um, in a little bit. Uh, waterfalls, special case form, so that's there are lengths and widths, and then um, with the waterfalls, you're also going to be collecting height, especially in gradient. And then Shoots, same thing as waterfall, um, beaver dams, marshlands. These are all special cases that you're seeing um, these arrows come in. So just those are all going to be that information is going to go on a special case form. And then you have T for tributary. So these are all the codes that you see on this list are all codes that go with the channel units. So I made this form last year. Um, I do have copies of this for everybody, but you'll see that here there's actually the slow water, fast water, dry, side channel tributaries. And this actually has the X or, you know, it says here's what you need to collect and the required um, items that you need to collect on each of these habitat units. So make sure that you do that when you're looking at these. You want to make sure that you collect the um, yeah all the information that's required for each of these habitat types units. And again, the nice thing is that we'll be able to be out in the field and we'll be able to talk about this more as we go along, but there, this is available for you. And I there's an Excel file and I also have copies of it for you for the, in the field on Wednesday. So you may, your forest may collect extra um, or optional attributes and forest options. So that aren't covered in this training. So make sure that when you talk with your coordinators at your forest level, that they are um, training you on those um, items. Like for on the Mount Hood, we collect our wood a little bit differently. We and we do repairing vegetation a little bit differently. So just make sure all of those aspects are um, that you're getting training for those at your forest level. So now what I'm going to do is the easiest way for me to show you how or to um, kind of give you that uh, idea about how to fill out that form and kind of do a general survey methodology. I'm going to have you go and watch the video on YouTube. Um, the nice thing is we'll actually be able to show you in the field too, but I think this is the best way in this virtual habitat to just kind of take it to take some time. I know it's a, it's a little bit long, but Take the time, watch that video, and then come back, and then we'll uh, go through kind of some of the things in that video um, uh, on how to fill out that channel unit form. So let me know if that, here's the link. Uh, let me know if that link does not work for you when I send it. There you go. Will it show up on on this form here or we go to our mail? So when you click it, you should take it should take you right to YouTube. I, and I, um, don't, I don't see anything to click. It should be in your. Can you get do you have your chat? Open your chat. Oh, OK. It should be okay. in your chat box. Ha, huh, got it. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm.
Okay, I think most people have um, viewed it, and if people do want to do a thumbs up, it's like, it's under that little smiley face under the chat. So if ever you wanna, there's all kinds of fun things in there. So don't go crazy, but. There are fun things under that chat, that little uh, thing. So hopefully everybody uh, got a chance to finish up that video. Um, you're going to see this stuff in the field on Wednesday as well, but I just wanted for those who weren't going to um, be potentially not be in the field, I wanted you to kind of get a chance to see that video because it does kind of go through some of all the aspects of kind of that survey methodology. So. So I just want to follow up on. So did anybody have any questions? Um, I just wanted to follow up on some of the items that I uh, will say over and over and over again. But um, you know the consecutive SOs and the consecutive fast waters and slow water numbers. And so by looking at this data sheet, you can definitely see that it's F1, F2, FN3, 4. So they're all consecutive, no matter what kind of fast water they are. And same with the slow waters. And just be aware that you know those side channels don't get included into the main um, uh, slow water units. That those are separate; they're off channel. So the consecutive ones come only on the um, main channel habitat units. Uh, data sheets are really important for you to be uh, clean and concise when you're writing out your data sheets. If somebody's doing data entry later on, they don't want to have to look at a um, somebody who you know a kind of a, a messy data sheet so you just want to make sure that your decimals are in the right places that the places that you don't need data aren't filled out um, and i like to put a line through those just to make it a nice clean data sheet so this is just an example of a culvert um, again this is the special case form like this is a round pipe uh, you know you've got your length of your structure your width so this is information that goes on that special case form, separate um, information that's not on the channel unit form. So just make sure that those sequence orders are the same as that are on the main channel form. And again, waterfall. So this one's got a pool underneath it. So this has definitely got a big jump height. So that would be a waterfall. And uh, just taking that information, the gradient is um, We'll talk more about gradient in the field because it's kind of difficult to explain, but it's definitely what we consider. Um, I don't think it's punch bowl falls. It's some. Um, this is over in Washington off of. Oh, I can't remember the creek. It's up in the Gifford Pinchot, but I don't think it's punch bowl. Um, sorry, <laughs> I was answering Zig. But we use our when we do gradients, we're looking at gradients at a um, like if a. A vertical fall, a straight vertical fall is at 200%. So once you go past the vertical, then you're going into infinity. So we're saying 200 is a straight up and down vertical. So then if you're going to be at uh, like a 45 degree, then that would be uh, 100%. So um, I did have somewhere, oh, Steve Brazier, he did share with me a, a um, a form that shows kind of the, the equivalent between percent and degrees and I'll try to um, uh, find that and grab it and let you guys see that so that you um, can look at that because it, it'll be better understanding that way. We can definitely talk about it more um, in the field for those of you who are going to be in the field with us. For those who are looking at uh, what asked about maybe asked about baffles, this is a culvert with baffles in it. You can see that there are pieces of wood in here and that they're designed to slow down the flow uh, in a in a higher gradient culvert for passage for fish. So that would be something that you would put on that um, data sheet if you had baffles. You don't see them very often, so anymore. Oh, and look, there's me. That's a special case. So uh, for those of you who are first time surveyors, these are kind of the cool things that you might get a chance to see. This was in my first year. It's Compass Creek Falls on uh, Elliott Branch or on Compass Creek, and uh, that was it. Was a pretty cool experience. A little life uh, threatening on the way out, but definitely one of those cool things that hopefully you all get a chance to see. 
And then there's these people who are the private landowners who this is an actual sign that we found in, as we were surveying up a creek. So um, definitely want to be aware when you're doing surveys to make sure you get permission as you go along. But I always think this is a, a, a funny sign. And that's all I got. And Dolly asked if, right, your uh, um, if the survey ends at the fall. It depends on what your forest decides you want to do. If you have if the waterfall, generally those big waterfalls are going to be the end of fish distribution going upstream, but you may have a resident population above. Amazingly enough, there are times when that happens. So it's really up to the forest whether or not they want to continue on above that waterfall. Sometimes they want to see if there's anything going on um, in the way of maybe slides or debris, something happening above that's going to affect the habitat below. So it's you need, just need to make sure what the um, actual forest fit the biologists want on the forest. Any other questions? And we'll get a lot more of this in the field on Wednesday, or, uh, Wednesday for those of you who are going to be out there. Um, definitely, if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to you know contact me and give me a call on. And we can chat about that if you're not going to be in the field, but hopefully uh, that information helped. Cool. No questions. All right. So we are going to. Since I can't see your lovely faces. We are going. We have another. Uh, a break scheduled just to kind of break things up. We'll do like a we'll do a 10 minute break here. So um, be back at um, 240. And we'll start with uh, temperature with Dave. Thanks. Hey, Kate, can I bring mine up just to make yep. sure? Absolutely. Hey, yeah. There you go. Okay. Yep, I got it. Okay.
Okay, Dave, whenever you're ready. Okay. I'm going to talk about the monitoring protocol for stream water temperatures. There it is. All right. Why do we take stream temperatures? We are monitoring the health of salmonids for one, and uh, we'll talk about some other reasons, but this is a primary driver for why fish biologists and hydrologists uh, want temperature data is to uh, assess uh, critical quality water a parameter and that um, in cooler waters fish are more likely to spawn their uh, survival improves and their longevity increases as well cooler waters in warmer waters there's less oxygen and more stress on the fish they're less likely to spawn and there's therefore there's an increase in infections by pathogens and parasites that take advantage of that warmer habitat. So there's increased mortality as a result of that. And we see that for particular species, there's thresholds that the DEQ has set and for different life stages as well. Um, and there's even a lethal limit for fish. So there, the temperature is a pretty critical uh, determining factor for the health and the survivability and uh, and uh, the reproduction of fish as well. So that's a big reason. So DEQ has criteria for water temperature for the Pacific Northwest. And we look at, we analyze for annual maximums of seven day rolling averages of daily max temperatures. That's I know that's a mouthful, uh, but uh, every day there's a maximum temperature, and that's averaged over a week's worth of average of maximum temperatures. You get an average for that week, and then that week rolls forward as the days progress. So every day has an, an assigned seven-day rolling average. Hopefully that makes sense. That kind of buffers out the extremes and the peaks and gives us a better handle on temperature regimes. Um, it has been mentioned before by Ryan and Katie that bull trout rearing has a critical threshold and it's very, very cool, 55 degrees. And uh, but salmon and, and trout, their core rearing, their non core, and their migration temperatures are much warmer than what bull trout require. But still, anything over 70 degrees is gonna be pretty limiting and and cause uh, health issues for your fish, for salmon especially. And so what we do is to make sure that we're looking at, we're getting accurate temperature data, we do these accuracy checks. And we check the accuracy of the probe in at least one bath. And so the protocol says to use a zero degree ice water bath at a stable temperature, like in a cooler. It's been sitting for an hour. But I like to use uh, an NIST, National Institute of Scientific Technology certified thermometer in a 20 degree water bath. And that's because um, that's the area of temperature that uh, I want to make sure we're accurate on because we're looking at peak temperatures. Okay, so we start the probe to record the maximum temperature at least every half hour from June through September. That's to capture that peak window of extreme temperature, which we uh, set our thresholds at. So we often report that peak temperature, that peak rolling day temperature. Um, and that's used to uh, uh, compare against the standards that DEQ has set that I just showed you. Um, and then we also prevent, I have been using anti-static bags for many years. That's because I had this 
mysterious problem with um, the old stowaways just mysteriously turning off and transporting them. And that, and I've noticed that ever since I use anti-static bags, I haven't had that problem. Or it could have just been Kluge, um, you know, slipping up when <laughs> launching those things. So it's really important to make sure those guys are blinking. They have a little red light at the end of them. Make sure they're blinking and handle them with care, transporting them. Okay, uh, the selection of the sites important. So we get a, a good average representative read on the temperature. Located near the mouth of the stream as a consistent part of the protocol. Um, they're placed in a well-mixed section of the channel to make sure we're getting well-mixed temperatures. And so, yeah, uh, Waldo's over there. He's avoiding deep alluvial substrates and areas of seeps and springs. That's because we're avoiding um, subsurface flow, but we're, we're wanting something that represents the stream itself throughout its region. And uh, just as a caveat, a re reminder that stream levels change throughout the season. So lowering flows, retreating flows, could expose a shallow logger to record air temperatures. So it's important that we go back and check those and that they are well concealed and that I, I make sure that uh, all my temperature recorders are because of all the recreational pressure and activity that goes on in our district between Salem, Portland, and Banby, um, I make sure they're well hidden. Maybe in your remote areas, you don't have to be concerned about that as much, but uh, I've learned the hard way that people tend to find these things and they just get curious and they'll end up throwing them up on the bank or destroying them, you know, smashing them. So I practice this art of sealing them. And, uh, but we want to make sure that the water flow is unobstructed around the probe. So there's good mix of flow gauging the recorder. A lot of times I'll put a flat rock over that PVC housing, but the flat rock it makes sure has water flow entering and exiting. So there's flow under that rock and it's not obstructed. Uh, so yeah, critical check is mid July is the Typical time of peak temperatures, pretty consistent, is during the last two weeks of July and the first week of, or two of August. So we want to make sure we get out there and capture that that period and that the temperature recorder has been tampered with. It's still under flow, submerged, functioning, still concealed, still blinking away. So after we retrieve the data at the end of the season, we make sure we get that data onto a hard drive as soon as possible, back up the data, label the files clearly, because it's irreplaceable data. You can't go back and get, just catch that data again, like a stand exam, for example. Um, we graphically display the data to look for outliers, for peaks, for anomalies, for spikes. There's air temperatures like in transport, or if it the flow retreated, and I've seen this uh, that the flow retreated uh, below the temperature recorder, then actually came up later. You can actually see that in the spikes. Um, the raw data files must show a minimum of three columns. So this is the standard protocol. We must this is the required minimum data that's be collected as date, time, temperature, and degrees Celsius. So we always set my orders for Celsius. And then uh, minimum of those three columns, those three fields are submitted, um, they're documented, they're, they're proofed by hydrologists, hydrotechs, fish files for further analysis. So that's the goal is to get that data checked downloaded in those three parameters and uh, captured, backed up. And then I do fun stuff, at least for me. I, I like Excel 
can't really get into graphing. And you can graph. I've got five different temperature stations in the North San Juan River here, and I'm just comparing one particular tributary, City Creek, Cedar Creek, to the main stem to see how its temperatures compare. And it's uh, in this case, Cedar Creek is much warmer than the main stem. And then uh, we you can draw the DEQ standard, the thresholds that they're looking for. So you see that uh, even Cedar Creek is is good for salmon, non-core rearing habitat, but uh, it may be exceeding. It's pretty concerning for core rearing, um, where they tend to spend most of their time when they're rearing. And then, of course, bull trout. Um, all but the most uppermost stream uh, station, water mo quality monitoring station, is is above those that threshold for bull trout rearing. So uh, we won't find bull trout. We won't be introducing bull trout in those four stations and those four locales above, or I should say, downstream of the uppermost North San Diego River. And we would continue to monitor that upper site to see if uh, this was just a real warm year or if it's consistently above that threshold for bull trout rearing, we would uh, eliminate that from a possibility for reintroducing bull trout. We have no bull trout on our district, so this is uh, one thing our fish biologists and the ODFW are looking hard at. They, every year they're looking for data, and they're trying to find where we may have cold enough water on our district to reintroduce bull trout. And then during the field seed survey, when you're actually out there um, in your leaky waders or sandals or whatever you're wearing, getting your feet wet, take a water temperature at the start and one at the end of each survey day. That's at the minimum. Enter that in not uh, Fahrenheit, but Celsius. Merge the thermometer for at least one minute. So you might put up like a pink flag on it, let it sit in the water where you can find it again record data, and then pick it back up again. Um, make sure it's adjusted for water temperature. And then take the stream temperatures within the mainstream channel at the same time riparian veg is being collected. That's a good time. That's a great time for that. And uh, every flowing tributary is required to take a temperature there at the mouth. So we can find, we got cold water input, or warm water input. If it's warmer than the main stem, main stem, then maybe looking upstream to find out why. If it's lost shade or got a landslide or fire, that that kind of investigation. And again, in Celsius, Celsius, Celsius. So in summary, uh, perform that accuracy check before and after deployment. That's a uh, minimum is an ice bath at zero degrees. Deploy a temperature recorder at the lower endpoint of survey. At least one temperature recorder should go in every stream you survey. And then inspect your recorder in the field in mid July, just before the time period of peak temperatures. Um, check on it in the field. And then after retrieval, Download the data, submit that to a hydro or a fishery specialist for graphing and analysis. Now that may be done by somebody um, after uh, your season ends, but uh, you may be involved in that. But make sure that you want to also take responsibility or ownership in that data to make sure it's um, it's downloaded, graphed, analyzed, captured. Okay. And then uh, if you're interested in the temperature monitoring program, um, this data goes into a corporate database called AQS in Enris. And there's climatologists, fish biologists at upper levels. They're looking at this data. ODFMW looks at the data. Um, so it's uh, an increasingly uh, val valuable 
monitoring protocol or program for data collection in the region. So that's all I had. I just want to encourage you, don't forget to monitor your own temperature. It's already hot. It's like 96 degrees here in Detroit today. So I'm reminded, I'm reminded as well. I want to remind you to keep cool out there, drink plenty of fluids, and uh, enjoy your summer. Any questions? How are we doing? I had one quick question. Okay. Uh, can you go back just to the previous slide there for, for a quick second? Okay, let me bring that up. Previous slide. We're showing the protocol there. Um, shoot, I'm sorry, I lost it already. <laughs> I think it was... Uh, yeah mentioning something to do with putting the, uh, the the temperature reading at the lower end point of the survey. I was just kind of wondering what you meant by that specifically. Oh, the lower end point of the survey is just near the mouth. But, OK, uh, that's kind of what I was thinking. Saying, yeah, why I said the lower end point is that it's not necessarily right at the mouth, because often at the mouth you have an alluvial fan there, because the substrate, the sediment that's transported by the stream that tributary um, often develops a fan it deposits there in the main stem and you have subsurface flow so not right at the mouth but you want to make sure you're in a representative stretch where you have good mixed flow that's not going subsurface unusual to the rest of the stream does that make sense yeah, that makes sense. And and you had mentioned too that we do need to take temperature readings near the mouth, but but what you meant by that was not it's not always right at the the mouth, but somewhere yeah. kind of close. You got it. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Also, I want to mention that before the crews go out for the summer, the the thermometer should be NIST tested also. Good point. Good point. Because they can, because they can be. You carry them in your bag, and they get bumped around, and and uh, some of them just might not. They separate. They could do all kinds of stuff. So you should have good thermometers to start the season with. I wish I had chocolate for you. <laughs> I'd be throwing it at you right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good point. Uh, nobody's ever brought that up, but that's an uh, excellent point. Yep, accuracy is really important. We need some virtual chocolate. Virtual chocolate. <laughs> uh, maybe a gift certificate or something. Huh? No, puppy. <laughs> Have a puppy on there. Uh, now we're getting there. <laughs> okay, anybody else any questions for Dave? All right. Thank you, cool. Dave. Yeah. Um. Big tall Bob, you're up with unstable banks. All right, let me pull up the presentation. Thank you, everybody. All right, does everybody see unstable banks? I see it. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yes, we can see it. OK, thank you. All right, so this is unstable banks that we'll present to you, and it's a measure of bank erosion. Why do we care about bank instability? Small particles of sand, silt, and clay are referred to as fines. These fines, they can fill the spaces between the gravels and cobbles, and we tend to call those interstitial pore spaces. And many fish use these gravels and cobbles to build their nests, and we call those reds, salmon, trout, and lamprey. 
And then the, the clogged spaces can reduce spawning success. It can impact uh, the survivability, um, but it also can uh, have impacts on our macro and vertebrae communities or those uh, aquatic um, bugs that live in the streams um, by having pollution or having too much sediment in these streams, we can affect observed uh, species that should be out there. And so a lot of times we can use macro invertebrates as well uh, for understanding how much of a sediment problem we might have. So what is unstable banks? It's ultimately a measure of instability. And uh, this condition is assessed in every main channel unit as we're doing stream survey. And it's ultimately the lineal length of eroding conditions on each bank. And it can be recorded as total of both banks as well. Uh, so, so we have options on how we are recorded. So what is assessed? It's the conditions of naked substrate above the bank full channel. Um, because recall through the bank full channel and below, we might have scour. Um, that frequent scour uh, and so what we're looking for is really above uh, that bank full channel it's the length of the eroding banks is what we're assessing so uh, measuring that length adjacent to every main channel unit and that's the required and uh, any site uh, these can be entered and recorded in nrm in that aqs uh, database so here are some indicators of bank erosion. Uh, naked soil and fines above that bankful stage. And so please recall the bankful stage is really down here. That flat depositional feature is our bankful indicator. And so the zone in which we're looking is uh, this zone immediately above that bankful zone. So naked soil and fines above. Uh, loose soil and fines perched atop the bankful channel, and that could be uh, colluvial material. And we'll talk about what colluvial material is here in a minute. Uh, there may be uh, little or no vegetation on the banks or on the hill slopes. It could be uh, the indicator could be tension cracks or collapsed banks as the soil separates or it could be the toe slope of a landslide where that enters the stream. So what is colluvium? Uh, colluvium is, is the general name for loose sediment or unconsolidated sediment. Uh, they have been deposited at the base of hill slopes by either rain wash, slow continuous downslope creep, uh, or it could be a combination of these processes. And a lot of times I think of colluvium as being gravity um, gravity is pulling it down. So now, uh, you know, we have uh, that potential situation where it's uh, a naked slope above the bank full, but uh, we might have a stabilizing bank. And uh, a stabilizing bank, you know, in this situation, it, it usually has vegetation. And that vegetation could be an indicator. It, we could be seeing signs of moss, uh, could be annual plants that are showing themselves, uh, young woody vegetation, could be shrubs or trees. It could be naked bedrock banks, you know, so we're not seeing any vegetation cover on bedrock banks, but that's that's a stable bank. Um, it's not producing fines. And then also uh, cobble and gravel banks where they're lacking fines. Um, so we can have a, you know, a deposition of some of this materials, but it's it's a stable bank if it, if it does not have fines within it. An undercut bank, uh, that's stable as well. You know, it might be naked, but uh, it, it, uh, it, it's really held together by that root system. And then it's also stable if it's not slumping, and we'll see an example of that here in a minute. So, you know, who is the judge? Who is the person that ultimately calls it stable? And it's it's your guys' call out in the field. 
Um, you guys are really the eyes for doing the stream survey. And uh, so it's, it's your professional judgment. Really evaluate the condition that you see out there and make an educated guess. Um, you know, think about the vegetation, think about if there's spines and uh, yeah, we'll show some examples here in a minute on ways in which we can uh, use our poles that were provided in stream survey for for kind of uh, knocking against the banks to see if there's any fines that come out. So here's a situation or one example in which we need to identify if that's stable or unstable materials. And so please recall the first thing we need to do is identify where that bank pool stage is in relation to where that material is. And uh, in, in this circumstance, uh, right above the bank pool stage, we have a lot of loose, unconsolidated material. And, uh, and so that's uh, an unstable portion of that reach. Here's another example. So here's our bank pool stage. Uh, we're using that indicator of uh, frequent scour for identifying it because it's not really a good indicator on this side at least. You know, we might have better indicators on that, but uh, we're using that moss scour line is that bank full stage and we can kind of see up in here that this is really more consolidated material. Um, this stuff is really being held together and it's not unraveling and it's really that vegetation is kind of the clue on what that process is. Uh, for stability of that bank. And so this would be classified as being stable. Here's another example. We've got the bank full stage right about in here and uh, just above a lot of unconsolidated loose material. It's kind of falling down from uh, some of these these banks and it's uh, it's being captured here and it's going to be uh, material coming into the stream, perhaps the next flood event. And so this one, I would identify this section of the, the reach as unstable. Uh, here's another example right behind a root wad that has been recruited into the stream channel. We've got our bank full stage kind of following our indicators from upstream and downstream, carrying it into here and we see it's here and uh, you know we might use our. Our stick as a probe and you know sticking it in there and it looks like some of this stuff is unconsolidated material that's loose and fallen down and uh, we would add this portion of the stream bank as being unstable. Uh, here's another example. Um, we don't have the bank full illustrated in this one. It's probably somewhere along this top of the undercut bank, the ceiling of that section. We 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 use our stick and you know we kind of poke and prod at a few different locations in here. And this material looks like clay might be holding it together and it's not really contributing fines. And so for this section of stream bank, um, we might call this stable. Um, however, if you do poke and probe and uh, this material is falling off rather easily, uh, perhaps in that situation, uh, call it unstable. Um, but really use the stick as an indicator for making an educated guess. Uh, here's another example of legacy practices that the Forest Service used to do before we really started um, implementing our best management practices. Uh, that's what I would call this. We don't really do this much anymore, these kinds of practices. If we look over here, we have some slumping banks that are coming in. Uh, they're fractured and beginning to slump down and contributing some bank instability. And so in those sections where we have some of that slumping, um, we would call that unstable banks. And then, uh, yeah, here's another situation. Bankful stage kind of right in here. It's kind of hard to see um, the indicators, the bankful stage in this image. But again, really looking from that bankful uh, floodplain zone, looking up above it, 
um, and really seeing, you know, are there unconsolidated materials or is there, uh, you know, stable vegetation um, that's providing bank stability? Really, what is that process through there? And uh, again, it's, it's really all about calibrating your eyes and uh, communicating within your team and using these lines of evidence uh, for really making good calls. Um, but we trust you and, uh, and uh, go out there and collect some really good data, folks. Yeah, so here in this situation, exposed high bank with some eroding fine sediment. And uh, that would be that section of the reach would be classified as unstable. So in summary, uh, unstable, unstable banks is an attribute that's measured in every channel unit throughout the whole survey. It's the zone that we're looking at is higher than the bank full channel. The bank full channel has that frequent scour and it uh, it's kind of the, uh, the limit for vegetation. And then we're looking at that right up above that, that zone. The length of both banks actively eroding is really what we're interested in. And uh, we tend to have bank stability forest plan standards that we use when we're looking at land use activities within that project area. And so this information on bank stability or instability um, feeds into our project reports in which we look at the condition of uh, the system, the streams out there. And so, yeah, the lengths on both banks is really what we're looking at. And then uh, remember, use those vegetation clues. Uh, it's really, it's to me all about the vegetation and uh, the particle size and uh, using these these lines of evidence for making good calls um, and having the indication of stability or instability out there. And uh, it's a judgment call made by you. And that is it for unstable banks. Katie, I believe we had a break uh, before riparian vegetation. Yeah, do you need a break or do you want to just jump into the repairing veg? Or do you want to get take that 10 minute break? Yeah, I could benefit from a 10 minute break. OK, so we will. Anybody have any questions uh, about on sale banks? Going once. Going twice. And we'll have a demo out there in the field where we'll look at some of this and uh, We'll do a little finger pointing and, and we'll have some some conversations about it in the field. And, you know, those are the best places for real conversations. And um, just want to say, you know, there is no dumb questions, especially when we're out there in the field. Um, I tend to think that some of my dumbest questions are some of the most clarifying for me. And uh, it really help work me through there uh, through any kind of situation that I'm having. And so, man, please, let's let's engage and free flowing conversations when we're out there and uh, let's have a lot of fun. Thanks, Bob. We, we always know the, the dumbest question is the one that's not asked, right? <laughs> yep. All right, cool. Well, we'll take a 10 minute break. Um, well, let's just go ahead and we'll, we'll come back at 3.30. We're gonna be done early today. So we'll um, go ahead and give you guys just a nice 15 minute break and we'll be back at uh, 3.30 to finish up. All right, thanks.
Hey, Katie, has it been 10 minutes? Uh, yeah, I gave them till 3.30, so. Thank you. You got a few minutes left. All right, everybody, I have 3.30 on my watch. And so I am gonna start back up with riparian vegetation. And, uh, and so vegetation has been something that a lot of early aquatics folks, uh, fish bios and hydros, I, I don't believe that they gave enough praise to. Um, I think riparian vegetation is the glue that holds these stream channels together. And it can be uh, compared to rebar and concrete. And in the literature, they call this process root reinforcement, and it can have huge implications on the channel's dimensions. And so uh, for this protocol, really what we're striving to do is characterize the vegetative streamside conditions. And so that's that's what I get to present to you guys. Kind of like what we were just saying, riparian vegetation is really the poor bastard stepchild of stream surveys. Um, for a very long time, riparian vegetation was overlooked for things like channel complexity and some of these other factors associated with channels. And so uh, know what your limiting factors are and, uh, and get to know some of the plant species that occur within the forests or ranger districts where you'll be collecting data at. Uh, we need to first clarify some disclaimers. Forests have the option in choosing how they collect riparian vegetation. If the forest chooses an alternative method, training must be done uh, back at the forest. And so in this presentation, what we're going to cover is really the minimum requirements using the the region six level two methodology. So what is this riparian zone mean? So get this laser out. And so we've got this aquatic zone over here being the area defined by water. Uh, 
Uh, and then over here, we've got this upland zone that is defined by our terrestrial folks as being um, species that occur most frequently in the uplands. But then we have this ecosystem that's kind of smashed in between the aquatic and uh, the upland zone. And this creates a unique assemblage of plants. And we use terms like obligate or facultative for talking about how much uh, certain plants can withstand growing in places with elevated water tables. And uh, as we go across these zones, uh, we might have different life forms of plants that we might encounter. We might have herbaceous things like sedges, rushes, and grasses growing next to the stream channel. We might have shrubs uh, that can be indicative of the presence of water or not. And then we also might have coniferous trees and uh, trees can tell some of these stories. Uh, we tend to see a lot of spruce in places where there's more groundwater present. And, uh, and so these different tree species can tell stories about uh, the different growing conditions they're in. Why does riparian vegetation even matter is a question that I, I hope you ask yourself. Uh, what is the point to this stuff? And so there's four processes that are emerging from science. Riparian vegetation provides shade to the stream, and that's the process is, is shading. And the function is really to maintain cold water for cold water dependent fish. And so, uh, you know, trees and things, they can't cool water down. But what they can do is uh, maintain those water temperatures. And, and so that's that's the one really important piece that we think about. Another one is nutrients uh, going to the stream. Imagine a stream with hardwoods lining the edges. And in the fall time, uh, these hardwoods, the, the leaves fall into the stream and they provide different contributions of nutrients than if conifer needles were the only thing uh, available and they fell in. What we see is different aquatic bug communities because of this process. Uh, root reinforcement, we kind of talked about it just briefly. And, and really the riparian vegetation provides bank stability and uh, it's really the core of what root reinforcement is about. And then uh, this riparian vegetation is also a source for large woody material. As Ryan Manzula had talked about the importance of, of wood in these stream channels, uh, this riparian vegetation is really the area where this stuff is recruited in. And in this picture, we have these really nice 300 year old uh, ponderosa pine trees that are contributing wood structure and complexity to the river um, in the form of wood complexity. So solar radiation, uh, here's an, an image of. Uh, um, this is the same stream. These were approximately 10 channel units apart from each other uh, where the solar radiation was collected at. And so in the first picture, we have some shading contributions from the lodgepole pine, um, but is this really all? And so look at the shading contributions of uh, of this shrub layer um, through here. And um, you know this just provides more layering of of shade directly over the stream. And so these things can uh, make a big difference in what those water temperatures are um, from the importance of riparian vegetation. All right, look at the power of riparian vegetation to control the channel form or the channel dimensions in this image. It's uh, pretty black and white in, in this picture. Um, you know, think about the habitat. So, you know, in here, this is the habitat that's being provided for Salmonid in this nice channel versus the habitat that's being provided uh, in here. And, and that's more of a, a ditch that, that could be, you know, perhaps biologically dead. But, um, you know, the wetted width, all of these things very different and um, the riparian vegetation in this circumstance 
it looks like it's more sedges and rushes. Um, first, in, in this circumstance where it's um, more grass species. Here's a really simplified diagram of food webs in aquatic and riparian systems. So, you know, we've got the leaf fall coming in and, and, and driving this, um, providing inputs for stream invertebrates. You know, some of these inverts might feed fish, uh, might emerge and feed bats, birds, might feed spiders, and it might fall back into the stream. And uh, these can drive biological processes. And I tend to think about the river continuum concept. Um, you know, that these streams are connected and um, in providing flows, uh, you know, kind of down gradient. And, uh, you know, the hardwood leaves, they tend to have higher nitrogen and phosphorus, whereas the conifer needles, uh, they can be high in carbon. And so, you know, those things can, can have impacts. So let's bring it back to the NR9 context. Where do we look for riparian vegetation? On the valley floor of large streams with an active floodplain, or it might be up the side slopes of a V-shaped valley. So it kind of depends on what the valley, the shape is for, for where we're reading this. And we're really looking at that 100 foot zone of the channel. So we tend to break it into an inner and an outer zone um, that we can choose to delineate or characterize the riparian vegetation. Um, be consistent on the width throughout the reach, and the width can be maintained throughout. Or it can be 100 feet if forests um, do not choose to characterize the outer zone. Uh, the outer zone is really a forest option. It can be the remaining 100 feet uh, from the channel minus the width. And so, yeah, this is the outer zone. And so it's really, um, it all depends on how we want to break it out. And so here's some examples for designating that inner riparian zone and a nice image to help. Uh, in example one, there's really no distinct vegetation zone. Pretty similar all the way through. Whereas example two, it tends to have this topographic break or change in a different plant community. And so we need to choose on how we're going to designate that and then be consistent for the entire reach. So this is how we do it when we're surveying. We assess in 10% of the main stem habitats. The first collection of riparian vegetation is on sequence order five, and then we go every 10th sequence order following that. We're really focusing on collecting the average of conditions on both banks for that reach. So we're trying to characterize it. We'll be looking at three indicators. And note the outer zone is a forest option. And so these are the indicators being um, collected. First, we have serial class. Then we have overstory. And then we have understory. So let's go ahead and take a look at, at some of these. And so here's serial class. And uh, go ahead and read that for a minute. And so it's advancing towards its climax community. It's a stage in the ecological succession. And so to do that, it's a bird's eye view, meaning that we're looking from a top down perspective. And we're interested in the diameter class that's supplying the most cover. Um, not really looking at those um, intricacies or those details really What's the diameter class applying the most cover? And diameter is measured at breast height. And for serial class, species does not matter. 
And so uh, our terrestrial folks have looked at how stands age over time, um, what we call succession, and uh, they go through these structure changes of being grass forb um, all the way to the mature tree. And so these are the different um, categories. Uh, this is how it's kind of an approximate stand age. So zero to five years, it's in this. Once you hit, you know, year, year six, you start to advance towards a shrub seedling. Um, and then if that stand is able to continue to develop in the absence of disturbance, um, goes into a sapling pole. And, you know, once you get up to 200 years, you're about looking at a mature tree um, that, that can you know, last about 700 years. And so really these are the diameter classes and these are the two digit codes on the bottom that we'll use for NR9. All right, so for overstory is the next indicator that we document for riparian vegetation. What is the dominant species if it's a woody, a woody tree? And we wanna document shrub if it's a shrub uh, dominant system. And then we'll go ahead and put GF, grass forb, if it's non woody is the dominant. And then we'll use the code uh, NV, no vegetation, um, if it represents no vegetation cover for most uh, of the inner or outer zone. And, you know, hopefully we're not seeing that kind of condition anymore. But it might be out there. Okay, the last indicator is understory. So enter the dominant understory species growing in the inner and outer zone. If it is not provided in the species list, uh, coded appropriately like the uh, overstory, SS, uh, simply shrub, grass forb, or no vegetation. So one more piece around understory. Each forest has the option uh, to define how it wants to, to define the understory. You know, what is the question that your forest is really concerned with? Is it the potential vegetation that's your focus and that we want to try to understand? Is it the shrub component of a multi-layered forest? Or could it be the subdominant woody species? Um, that's really our interest. Whatever that is, um, you're going to see some more training and your local forest uh, must provide that training. And so let's go ahead and explore some of the uh, some examples of, of what we're even talking about through this riparian vegetation and how we might think about it. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and do a bird's eye view looking at seral state. You know, so we have the stream channel kind of flowing down the middle. We have a hundred foot zone on one side. We have another hundred foot zone on the other side. So we're really looking at that 200 foot zone. Do we want to call it, you know, one zone at a hundred foot, or do we want to think about this as two zones, each being 50 feet? Um, and so really, you know, look at the difference in the vegetation age from stand development to guide us. And uh, for this for this circumstance, you know, we're, we're seeing two different communities um, as being the uh, representative throughout the whole reach um, that we would really want to characterize. You know, there is some little inclusions of this uh, more mature spruce community but it, it seems to be a smaller patch uh, within the matrix of this overall riparian zone. And so, for, yeah, for this one, we would, um, I would likely split it into two. So let's go ahead and explore this site here. Um, both sides are pretty much the same. The serial class that we have is less than 21 inch in, in DBH. Uh, Doug fir is the most common, and then red cedar is common in the understory. And so this is how we would uh, 
we would break it out and we would have the ST for less than 21, the CD for the Doug fur, and uh, this is the red cedar code for the understory. And so that's how, how we would code it out um, through this protocol. Let's look at this example. Um, both sides of the stream are in the same condition. Uh, the serial class is less than eight inches DBH. We have red alder, our most common in the our common, and then uh, shrubs common in the understory. And so uh, for this circumstance, the serial class less than eight inch. Um, we're looking at the SP, small small pole, I believe it is. Uh, the red alder is most common, and uh, this is its code, HA. And then shrubs are common in the understory, and that's where we want to um, do the simply shrub. All right, a uh, few trees in this, um, okay. Both sides of the both sides are the same condition. A few trees are greater than 36 inch DBH, but most of the trees are less than 32 inch DBH. Um, Ponderosa pine are the largest, with uh, grand fir is the most common, and then we have very young shrubs and, and saplings common. And so uh, this is a little tricky. A few trees. Um, being in this large category versus most being in this. And so we would want to put it in the large tree category and not in the mature tree, because this is really what's most common um, looking down and, and not really just focusing on the few trees, really looking at what's most common throughout that area. Uh, Ponderosa is the largest, but Grand Fur is the most common. And so uh, the Grand Fur is the CW. And then uh, very young shrubs and saplings common. And that's the, the simply shrub again, for the understory. All right, um, Ryan Manzula did uh, present an excellent job on some of these invasive riparian plants. Um, this is the list for the Pacific Northwest. And uh, these yellow ones are the ones that are being highlighted as being most frequently observed. And so that's we're going to go through those again. Um, we're going to look at the yellow flag iris, the knotweeds, uh, the hogweed, and uh, the Himalayan blackberry rather quickly um, as we end this. And so here is uh, the yellow flagged iris. Um, it is uh, actually native to Great Britain, North Africa, and the Mediterranean region. It's uh, toxic to humans and livestock. Um, touching its resins can cause skin irritation to humans. It's um, just like all of these, an invasive ornamental uh, perennial. And so, you know, people think that they're really pretty and they plant them in their garden. And uh, um, looks like they're pretty widespread. There's really good documentation around the Seattle, Olympia, and Portland area. Um, but we also had this puppy show up in the Middle Fork John Day um, over here on this side of the Cascades. And uh, yeah, it looks like a fan with the multiple leaves, um, like a sword uh, coming from its submerged stem. And it's the only yellow iris in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but this this specimen, it can alter wetland hydrology and it can really fill in some backwater areas. And so it can uh, disturb processes in some of our streams. And uh, again, it's important for early detection. And, and uh, just what we want to emphasize is if you see something that doesn't look normal, you know, work with the folks back in your unit, bring, bring the specimen back, talk to the botanist, uh, talk to the inv invasive weeds coordinator, um, find out who the key players are back at your unit and, uh, you know, work with them because we're kind of all eyes out on, on these landscapes and, uh, you know, we can be early detection. All right, here's the knotweeds and uh, there's about three species that we kind of break into to kind of one knotweed. 
and it can grow to over 12 feet high. It can release toxins in the soil to inhibit other plant growth. Um, and uh, new shoots can grow from nodes. Um, and if it's masticated, it can grow into many new plants. So this could just be a nightmare. And uh, native to Asian and Japan, member of the buckwheat family, and it kind of resembles bamboo. Um, and this stuff can quickly become a dense stand and it outcompetes all other plants and uh, creates these monocultures. And, uh, you know, it can just be bad for ecosystems. And these things can affect birds, affect all kinds of things. Uh, here is the giant hogweed, um, an undesirable invader, really due to its large size and its uh, prolific seed production and its vigorous growth. Um, causes major changes in vegetation, soil erosion, and it can have some serious skin sensitivities. Uh, this thing is native to Russia. That's where it needs to go back to. And it's an ornamental plant that is still available um, for purchasing. And uh, the last of the invasive plants is the Himalayan blackberry that I'm going to share with you. And this is another garden escapee prized for its berries. It's got the rapid um, spreading conditions and it just requires repeated chemical treatments to try to eradicate it. Um, as Ryan pointed out, this can be confused with the native blackberry, which has three leaflets. And so the Himalayan having five leaflets is kind of the go to. Uh, so, you know, get to know what the native plants are in your area, get to know what some of these watch out plants are and, and keep an eye out for them and uh, and communicate with uh, folks back at your your unit. And uh, and that's really all we have um, associated with this riparian vegetation. Katie. Hey, Bob, somebody. Yeah. Uh mentioned reed canary grass and i don't believe that reed canary grass is actually on our watch list is it as i'm thinking about it i didn't see it on there and so yeah i'm not quite sure why it's not on our watch list but uh yeah it, yeah. it has some of the similar properties to some of these where it really invades it out competes and it creates a monoculture and so that's a really good question to take to uh IAA. AIS coordinator and, and kind of find out why it came up our watch list. Yeah, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not sure when it was on. I'd have to go through back through my years, but. Um, but, you know, like Scotch broom is not on there anymore either. So I think sometimes they I don't know if they take stuff off that they feel that they can't control or what the deal is, but. Um, thanks for bringing that up, though, since that was definitely I mean, it is something that. I mean, they used it for early on for what? Uh, bank control, right? So, I mean, <laughs> might still be used in certain places, unfortunately. So. Any other questions about um, repairing veg or invasives? One reason why I had um, Bob include that at the end of his presentation is that as you guys are, I mean, as you're doing your repairing veg and you're climbing up on the banks, you know, it's just be on the lookout for these items, these invasives, because that's the one time that you're going to be up on the um, off the stream bed, up on the banks. So just make sure you're keeping your eyes out for those um, species that really are going to have some uh, bad effects on potentially on the stream. So. All right, it's got a couple things I want to touch base on as I was going through some things before we uh, finish up for the day. Thanks all presenters for your hard work and uh, good presentations. The um, part one of this morning's um, class is on the R6 Rumentary YouTube channel. Um, I just uploaded it so that first half is on. Hopefully when we get done today, the second half will go on um, pretty quickly, so it should be on by tomorrow. Um, so those will be available for anybody who missed. This you can um, send them to the YouTube channel and it will be available. Uh, Raymond asked about is there a good list for natives and invasives? 
if you look in the there's a really good primer what i think it's a really good primer in the binder which you'll find on the website um under the uh, invasive tab there's a really nice primer that goes through all of these type all the ones that are on the list plus i think there's a couple extra in there as well and that will really um, be a good one to look over and um, it'll be it's a good guide for you so i would check that out um yeah natives are one of those things where you just kind of have to you have to know what's in your forest because that's definitely every forest is going to be different um i really want i wanted to touch base real quick on there is a i forgot i didn't it was supposed to be in my presentation but we talked about uh, residual pool depth when identifying pools and let me quick share my screen here so this is the uh, kind of a guide for if you're doing a stream oh boy that's bad um and you want to figure out what your residual depth is for identifying pools because sometimes pools aren't always they're kind of crazy you're not sure exactly whether you should call one but here's a guide for on um, the bank for width average of what your residual depth would be for you to identify a pool so if you're in a smaller stream you're going to have a smaller residual depth and so some of those are going to count as pools where if you were in a big stream and you got 0.3 residual depth not going to be a very good quality pool so this is just a guide it um granted you don't have to um go solely by this but it's a good guide it goes about what your bankful is and then what your residual pool depth is and that would be so if you had a stream that's 35 feet bankful width um, you would go with a foot residual depth and if you didn't have a residual depth of one foot in any of your in the pool that you're looking at that's got some looks like pool but it doesn't quite meet that one foot criteria then you would go and move on so it kind of helps you get past those ones that you can might stand there and look at for a while and be like oh i don't know if it's a pool or not and uh, I'm like what, what is it and then if you have this residual depth in your head and you mark it down on your data sheets right away this will give you that guide to help you just um move a little quicker through those um pool identifications and that is in on um, tab i wrote this down it's in tab five this guide here is in under tab five of the binders on page 36 and again that can be found on that uh, website that i gave you earlier this morning which would, should be in the chat somewhere and i can uh, send those out uh, later as well does anybody have any questions about anything they um saw today um or heard or not sure about and have any questions will we be able to have uh printed out manuals um i don't know our okay. printing place <laughs> i i sent it off to who was supposed to be responsible for the printing and uh they did not i i did got no response from them whatsoever so oh, i need man. to um double check on that but i may end up getting still going ahead and doing that um just to get them at least a few published and if i do that then i'll get those out to the forest oh that would be nice uh, i'll just put it on my phone okay and i and I have, you know, we did print out some smaller sections for the training um, on Wednesday, just so you have some stuff to go by, but. Oh, good, that would be helpful. Yeah, it's like the main section of the, the data sheet. So it'll help you have some help for you, so. Anything else from anybody? All right, well then we are done for today. Um, we will be back tomorrow at 0800. I will provide a um, evaluation form tomorrow for you guys to fill out for those who are just going to be in the first couple days and just give us some ideas about these virtual. We're still kind of all new to the virtual world. So um, then we will uh, I'll also provide a tax exempt form for those who are traveling to sisters. I've got that electronically, so I'll provide that tomorrow as well. And don't let me forget to provide that for you. 
Um, somebody asked if there is an agenda for the in-person. Oh, the, yes, there is a field agenda. And I can, let's see if it'll let me share that. I did send out a field agenda. Hopefully most of you got that, but just in case people didn't get it. For those that are going to be traveling to sisters on uh, Tuesday or meeting us up on Wednesday morning. I don't get that right now. Let's see. Been having some issues copying things into here for some reason. <laughs> 